So Ed, we're ready when you're ready. Okay. Thank you, Charlotte. Okay, everyone. Um, uh, welcome to the uh, Connecticut Avenue Northwest uh, reversible lane operations and safety study. This is public meeting number one. This is five o'clock uh, PM and this is the learning room. We're looking at concept review and evaluation at six o'clock. Uh, we'll look at uh, traffic and parking and at seven o'clock we'll start our main meeting. Charlotte Duxworth is going to give us a little uh, bit of uh, information on the WebEx uh, platform. Charlotte. Thank you, Ed. Welcome you all to our virtual learning room. Um, please be patient with us as we um, go over the WebEx controls. Please note this is an open meeting and that's required by DC code 2578. This meeting is being recorded and the recording will be made available to the public on the project website noted here. If you need technical support during this meeting, please call 202-705-7859. Next slide. There's also audio and video controls. Everyone is on mute currently and you cannot unmute yourself. We can unmute you during the question and answer and comment period. This helps ensure that we run um, the meeting smoothly. To request to speak, you will use the raise hand feature, which we will go over shortly. Um, your video camera is also off by default and you will not be able to share video so that we can maintain bandwidth. Next slide. If you have a question during the presentation, send it via the Q&A feature. If you've called in by telephone, um, we will go over in the next slide how you um, participate in the Q&A function. To send a question, click the question mark icon from the controls at the bottom of the browser window. A new panel will appear in the ask field, select all panelists, click the text box to type your question and press the enter key to send it. Next slide. If you have called in and you have a question or comment, please use the raise hand option on your telephone. You will dial star three to use the raise hand function. Um, if you are using the WebEx feature to virtually raise your hand, click the three dot icon from the controls at the bottom of the browser window and select the raise hand option. Next slide. So, um, in order to see the ASL interpreters, we recommend that you view it in the side by side view. So, in order to change your view, if you're looking at it in the stack view, which is the default view, click the layout, uh, layout icon located on the upper right hand side of the main window. Select the side by side view. This will move the video to the right, right panel, and the ASL interpreter will appear in the larger box on that panel. Thank you so much, Ed. I turn it back over to you. Thank you, Charlotte. We're going to have a little bit of an introduction and overview. We'll have a much fuller introduction uh, when we start our main meeting. I want to introduce the project team. I'm Ed Stoloff, the DDOT project manager. Uh, Cynthia Lynn is the deputy project manager. Michael Glickman is our consultant project manager from the firm of AMT. Charlotte Duxworth and Ian Swain, they are our public involvement consultants from Community ET. Anne Marie Turner is our safety consultant from Sam Schwartz Engineering. We have a number of DDOT subject matter experts tonight that will help answer some of our questions. For traffic engineering, Zushan Dang and Yi Zhao. Active transportation, George Branion, Mike Goodnow, and Will Hansfield. Parking, David Litzcomb. Loading and freight, Laura McNeil. Transit priority, Megan Kanegi and Johannes Benhoff. Ward 3 Planning Sustainability Representative, Ed Van Hooten. So how does this learning room relate to the entire public meeting? You're in the concept review and evaluation learning room. You'll be here from 5 to 6 p.m. At 6 p.m., we will start the traffic analysis and parking learning. You may attend both learning rooms. The content includes slides that will be repetitive. It'll be shown in the public meeting starting at 7 p.m. Learning rooms provide participants with an opportunity to ask questions related to specific content areas. In terms of our meeting agenda for the learning room, we'll do a project overview and the existing conditions. We'll talk about the alternatives that we developed and how we evaluated the alternatives. 
We'll talk about concepts B and C and our safety and mobility improvements, and we'll answer your questions before closing. The objectives of the learning room are to identify study goals and potential concepts that might fulfill those goals, to understand why the study is being completed, to identify trade-offs, benefits, and technical issues associated with each concept. We want to show why concepts B and C have risen to the top, and we want to show you our safety and multimodal improvements. If there are any feasible design alternatives or solutions that you believe DDOT may not have considered, given the goals and guiding principles of the study, please let us know. In terms of the project goals, one, we want to reduce vehicle crashes and improve safety for all modes. Two, we want to consider a protected bicycle lane. And three, we want to look at the feasibility of removing reversible lane operations. This is a map of the study areas, the primary and secondary study area. On the left, you will see a blue bar, a blue, co uh, blue corridor. It, the corridor extends from Legation Street to the north and Calvert Street to the south. You'll see that we've studied 24 intersections within that corridor. The red lines represent the secondary study area, and the secondary study area to the north is Western Avenue, Mass Avenue to the west, DuPont Circle to the south, and Broad Branch Road and Beach Drive to the west. You'll see on the right a regional context map, and it shows how Connecticut Avenue fits in to the regional context. Connecticut Avenue is a principal arterial, and the speed limit is 30 miles per hour. The curb to curb width is 60 feet and includes six 10 foot travel lanes. The daily volume on Connecticut Avenue is about 24,000 right around Calvert Street and about 32,000 vehicles per day right around Porter Street. The corridor is about 2.7 miles in length. In terms of the guiding principles uh, for study, one, quality of life. We want to be able to accommodate the needs of people who live and work and shop and recreate in the corridor. We want to reduce the number of crashes and fatalities. We want to incorporate complete streets principles to reduce vehicle speeds along the corridor. And we want to look at traffic operations, parking and loading, pedestrians, bicycles, transit. And also the alternatives that we look at must be constructed within a 60 foot curb to curb cross section. I want to give you a little idea of, of the alternatives that we've developed so far and what we found. DDOT started with four alternatives for build concepts, A, B, C, and D, O, plus a no build concept. We received potential concepts from the public and our community advisory committee, and those concepts are concepts D1, D2, and concept E. The no build concept, concept A, and concept DO would require MUTCD compliant overhead signage and signal. And this is not supported by the Commission on Fine Arts and the State Historic Preservation Office. Alternatives B and C are rising to the top in terms of their potential viability. Alternative B removes the reversible lanes only. There are no protected bicycle facilities. Alternative C includes one way protected bicycle lanes and removes the reversible lanes. All alternatives include elements to improve safety and mobility, including far side bus stop relocations. We're also recommending that the speed limit along Connecticut Avenue be reduced from 30 miles per hour to 25 miles per hour. In terms of some findings, uh, it's really difficult to meet the full purpose and need. If we remove the reversible lanes, and accommodate some parking and loading and accommodate some PBLs, then the widths and buffers of the protected bicycle lanes would have reduced dimensions. If we provide for only the removal of the reversible lanes, and that's in concept B, we are not accommodating multimodal safety and accessibility goals. As far as the no build management option, it does not appear to meet the purpose and need. It does not reduce crashes, does not retain the reversible lanes or retains the reversible lanes. 
It does not meet the multimodal safety and accessibility goals and requires overhead signage and signals, which are not supported by the Commission on Fine Arts or the State Historic Preservation Office. Cynthia Lynn is going to talk to you a little bit about the concepts. Cynthia? Thanks, Ed. So the first concept we'll discuss is the no build management option. Uh, this is similar to operations to pre COVID conditions where a two lane reversible lane system is intact. Uh, there would be no upgrades to overhead signals and signage uh, during the peak period. There would be, it would be similar to pre COVID conditions where we are looking at four lanes in the inbound direction, two lanes in the outbound, and then the reverse in the PM. During the off peak periods, there's two travel lanes in each direction with parking on both the east and the west sides of Connecticut Avenue. Um, as part of this option, there might be some improvements to enhance pedestrian accessibility and safety, uh, such as intersection improvements. And overall, we're modeling this as the baseline concept uh, moving forward. Next slide. Concept A retains the reversible lane system. This does require some upgrades to overhead lane signals and signs. Uh, during the peak hour, there's three travel lanes in the peak direction and one travel lane in the off peak direction. Um, during the off peak periods, there are two lanes in each direction, both two northbound and two southbound. This option does provide a protected bicycle facility on both sides of the street that is protected with buffers. However, this concept does require that all parking along the corridor be removed, which is around 600 spaces or so. Concept B removes the reversible lane system. The peak hour operation for this concept would include three northbound lanes and three southbound lanes. During the off peak periods, there would be two lanes in each direction with parking and loading on both sides of the street. This option, however, does not provide a protected bicycle facility and as similar to pre COVID conditions, parking would only be permitted during the off peak hours. Next slide. Um, this slide should show an illustration of what concept B would look like if it were implemented. Uh, the street geometry is similar to existing conditions without the reversible name. Concept C removes the reversible lane. Uh, during both the peak and off peak periods, there would be two uh, travel lanes in each direction, so two northbound and two southbound. This does include a protected bicycle lane on both the left or the east and west sides of the street. Um, also, there would be an opportunity to accommodate left turn pockets as well as, well as parking in some locations. Um, we'll go into more depth on what this looks like uh, later on in the next slide. So this is an illustrative rendering of what concept C may look like if it were implemented. We're showing on the left two lanes in each direction with a protected bike lane on both sides of the street. Uh, this does have a floating bus island, or in this case, a Zekla platform, which helps to uh, reduce the number of conflicts between bikes and buses along the corridor. Next slide. Uh, this is showing a layout of the different cross sections of what concept C might look like. So on the left, a mainline section that is showing the two lanes in each direction with a protected bike lane. The middle uh, would, would show a cross section with a left turn pocket, um, and that would be accommodated by reducing some of the buffer width and the travel lane widths. And then on the right, a parking and loading lane where we would accommodate parking on one side of the street in the commercial areas for 20, 24 hours day, seven days a week. And uh, the location is pending more um, consultation with some of the businesses as well. Next slide. Concept DO retains one reversible lane. This does require an upgrade of overhead signals and signage. Uh, during the peak hour, there would be three travel lanes, uh, three lanes in peak hour direction, two travel lanes in the off peak direction. During the off peak hours, two travel lanes in each direction with parking on the northbound side. This does provide a two way protected cycle track. Uh, four lane, it'd be four feet for each of the bike lanes and then a two foot buffer. Um, as part of DDOT's bicycle facility design guide, we often do require that left turn pockets for vehicles be provided to reduce the number of conflicts between 
the cycle track and left turning vehicles. However, given that this concept does re retain the reversible lane, that would not be constructible in this scenario. Next slide. Concept D1 also has the two way cycle track on the western side of the street. However, um, this concept removes the reversible lane. Traffic operations at all times of the day would be two travel lanes in each direction. There would be some opportunities for a northbound parking and loading lane and some locations for uh, left turn pockets. Um, like we talked about before, for the bicycle facility design guide to have left turn pockets, this concept would allow for that design to happen. Slide. Concept D2 also removes the reversible lane and does have a two way protected cycle track on the western side of the street. Uh, for traffic operations here, there would be two lanes in each direction and a two way center left turn lane during the peak hour. During the off peak periods, we'd be looking at one northbound travel lane and two, south, two southbound travel lanes with the two way center left turn lane um, as part of this concept. Slide. And the last concept we'll discuss is concept E, which uh, combines all the elements that we just talked about. Uh, this does remove the reversible lane system during the peak and off peak periods. There would be two travel lanes in each direction with parking and loading on both sides of the street at all times of the day. This would also include a two way cycle track on the western side of the street. However, the fatal flaw of this concept is that it does require DDOT to move outside of the 60 foot curb to curb. And um, that does not conform to the guiding principles of the project and also would conflict with the Cleveland Park street, streetscape design further along the corridor. And then I'm going to turn it over to Michael to discuss the evaluation criteria. Thank you, Cynthia. Uh, so the uh, evaluation criteria uh, used to uh, compare and evaluate uh, each of the concepts uh, includes traffic safety, traffic operations, Bicycle accessibility and comfort, pedestrian accessibility and comfort, transit accessibility and operations, parking, loading, and pickup drop off areas, uh, constructability, and finally implementation. Uh, and within each of these elements, we, we also ensure that we're uh, consistent with the District of Columbia plans, including Move DC, the Bicycle Master Plan, Vision Zero, Sustainable DC 2.0, and the Bicycle and Pedestrian Safety uh, Amendment Act of 2016. Next slide, please. So our approach in uh, evaluating the uh, each of the concepts uh, includes um, the development of an evaluation matrix, a concept evaluation matrix. And what we did is we broke this up into really two screening uh, processes. Uh, the first is the uh, whether or not the alternative can fit within the existing 60 foot curb to curb width. Uh, the second looks at uh, comparing uh, the attributes, the pros and cons of each concept to one another. So this is, we developed a relative score, scoring so that essentially we are uh, reviewing each concept against each other uh, and we assign a value. So if it's uh, desirable, it has the elements that, that we're looking for in terms of this project, it would give a plus two. If, it, if it's contrary to what we're trying to do with this project, it's uh, considered uh, at, at the lowest end, not desirable at a minus two. Next slide, please. Uh, this provides a little bit more detail in, in terms of how we uh, looked at the evaluation criteria and then scored uh, each of the concepts based on that criteria. So if you look at the, the, the second to top row, uh, you can see that the scoring, uh, as I mentioned, the, the minus two is denoted in red. And that goes to uh, a, a dark green, which is plus two as desirable. So just a, a couple items to, as an example, uh, a minus two would be uh, retaining the reversible lanes because that's something that uh, we're we're trying to do as part of this project to improve safety. Uh, a, a, a plus two uh, could be the uh, addition of bike lanes because we're looking to introduce some more multimodal elements uh, to the corridor. Next slide, please. This is the, uh, the results of our uh, evaluation uh, matrix. Screen one, as I described earlier, is a fatal flaw analysis. And if you look across, the only concept that does not meet the 60 
foot curb to curb width would be concept E, which is 67 feet. So at that point, we, we dismiss concept E in terms of uh, it's, it's not meeting the, uh, the, the purpose and need of the project. Uh, the second screen would be uh, all the evaluation criteria I, I referenced earlier. And you can see how, that each of the scoring that we, we show here is all uh, relative to the, to the purpose and need and also uh, to each concept itself. Uh, as Ed mentioned earlier, the two concepts that are, have, have risen to the top uh, are concepts B and C. You can see they're the only two that have scored a positive value on the matrix. Next slide, please. So uh, now we're going to get into some of the safety benefits uh, relating to concepts B and C. Um, both concepts have have uh, opportunities to um, make improvements at a at an intersection uh, level and a corridor level as well. Uh, so we'll start with the uh, uh, removing the reversible lanes that would eliminate uh, crashes that are occurring currently. We have a uh, we we. Definitely seen that as a causation for, for uh, numerous accidents uh, in, a, in a high percentage of the crashes that are occurring along the corridor. Um, we, uh, the, the addition of protected bike lanes, obviously, it would protect uh, uh, cyclists along the corridor. Uh, it, it, it also um, would decrease vehicular crashes as well that because of the well, slow speeds and also some of the angular crashes uh, that are occurring with, with cyclists currently. Um, Adding turn lanes to intersections, uh, this would, uh, you know, we, we are seeing uh, certain intersections where, where we have a high number of angle crashes, uh, rear end crashes. So adding turn lanes would uh, certainly improve that. Uh, removing uh, parking at, to improve visibility at crosswalks, uh, pedestrian refuge islands would uh, calm traffic and provide protection for, for pedestrians. And then finally, left turn, turn calming treatments really are just meant to slow down those turning vehicles so they're not uh, in conflict pedestrians and, and cyclists. Next slide, please. So these are the uh, safety and mobility improvements uh, relating to concept B. Uh, concept B does provide opportunities to install left turn calming treatments at certain intersections. Uh, we can include 25 foot um, uh, parking clearance around crosswalks and at intersections to uh, allow uh, sufficient sight distance for pedestrians and vehicles turning. Uh, in addition to that, we have uh, items, uh, we have hawk signals located at two locations, uh, Legation and Chesapeake, no turn on red restrictions at, at uh, approximately five intersections, uh, as well as some uh, geometric uh, improvements along the side streets as well where there's some unusual geometry or skewed approaches. Next slide, please. So in addition to the safety measures uh, described under concept B, concept C uh, allows for some additional uh, improvements. Uh, one obviously is the protected bicycle lanes uh, along the entire corridor. Uh, we, we also are introducing turn pockets uh, as, as I referenced on the earlier slide to reduce crashes and uh, and pedestrian refuge islands that would work in coordination with those turn lanes uh, to uh, provide a safe area for pedestrians crossing the street. Next slide, please. So as we move forward with our detailed design, uh, we'll, we'll look further at, at the relocation of bus stops uh, to improve uh, transit operation and pedestrian safety accessing uh, uh, at uh, the, the bus stops. Uh, we did a preliminary analysis that shows the relocation of uh, 17 bus stops. Uh, and we'll just need to, uh, at, at, a, at the next level of design, we will get more into the feasibility of those relocations. Uh, some of the benefits of far side bus stops uh, increase pedestrian visibility. Um, reduce conflicts for right turning vehicles trying to pass about a stop bus. And <clears throat> oftentimes the far side bus stops can provide enhanced service uh, for, for the, uh, the, um, uh, the buses as well uh, as compared to the near side locations. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Uh, we're now gonna turn this over to uh, Charlotte and Ian. Uh, they're going to moderate the uh, 
uh, discussion and uh, we'll try to answer some questions for you, uh, Charlotte. Thank you, Ed. Um, Ian, are you ready to get started with our first question? Yes, I am. Thank you. Ed, the first question uh, states, I would like to hear some crash uh, statistics for Connecticut Avenue, particularly those concerning occurring during peak hours or transitions to and from reversible lanes. Thank you. Sure. sure. Um, I'm going to turn that turn over that to, to Anne Marie. Anne -Marie. Uh, I think we hear, think an, we echo. hear an echo. So oh, Anne Marie Turner. Anne Marie Turner. Hey, yes. Hello. Hey, yes. Hello. So it's so because that B doesn't meet uh, multimodal and safety goals. Why is it still being entertained? Um, the the goal is to look at um, as many concepts as possible so that we're not overlooking. Sorry, here, let me start my video here. So we're not overlooking anything, and and that's a balance. And so we're we're trying to come to the community to to get your input. Um, and so at this point, these are the two that are the best, you know, or these are the ones that we're looking at. Um, so we're just looking for your input. Um, so that's why, you know, cyclists still can ride on the street, even though a, a dedicated facility is not provided. Um, and so, yeah, at this point, we're, we're really looking for community input. Thanks, Ed. Uh, the question. Anything you want to yeah. add? You don't worry about it. The question number one says, uh, I would like to hear some crash statistics for Connecticut Avenue, particularly those occurring during peak hours or transitions to and from reversible lanes. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. I can give you some of that. Um, so we looked at 1,507 police reported crashes. Reported crashes. And from those, and crashes, from those crashes, here, we here, determined it. Hold on just a second. Mm. Can you hear me now? Uh, we determined that um, 401 resulted in injuries or possible injuries, 64 involved pedestrians, or 39 involved cyclists. What we did find is that 46% of overall crashes occurred during the first lane hours. Of those crashes, 36% of them could be directly attributed to the reversible lane condition. Um, so um, and a lot of that was like vehicles turning out of the wrong lane or making U turns, or like drivers confused with the operation of their versatile lane system. So, yeah, so we, we did look at that. And when we also, when we looked at uh, comparable corridors, we did find that Connecticut Avenue was had a higher crash rate than some quarters, like uh, Wisconsin Avenue, South, uh, Massachusetts Avenue, but was lower than, say, Rhode Island Avenue or George Avenue. Hopefully that answers your question. Thanks, Anne Marie. Thanks, Ed. Are you ready for the next question? Sure. If concept C is adopted, will it be possible to use the same concrete barriers that were used on Crosstown Cycle Track by Washington Hospital Center? These provide much more protection than the little wheel stops. One of our subject matter experts elaborated on this and the answer uh, in the Q&A, but I wanted to uh, make sure it was um, presented to the whole group. I mean, may, I, I can take that as well. This is Will Hansfield and, and thanks for uh, the question. Sorry, let me orient this a little bit better. Um, we have a variety of barriers. We usually we don't determine which one will be used until we've sort of we've nailed down the, the general geometry. Um, so we have some ideas based on if, if concept C is selected. Um, and I can tell you a little bit, you know, it's, it's a fairly narrow cross-section for all the things we're trying to fit into it. Um, if we did go with that cross-section, uh, it's something like an eight, eight inch wide barrier would be appropriate uh, to, to sort of give that extra protection as well as fit what we have as available space. Well, we're gonna be trying some of those out on Florida Avenue in the coming year. Um, we have a variety of other things. I think we've, we've probably seen concrete wheel stops used. We've used, um, I think we're calling what we're using on Irving concrete pills. They're about two feet wide, kind of pill shaped, they're eight feet long. Um, so that decision will come, but but probably will be narrower than, than Irving Street just because of the constraints of the right of way. Thank you. Thanks, Will. Thanks, Will. This question is for uh, Michael and Ed. Why does parking loading PUDO 
have a score of negative one for concept C, it actually is between plus one and negative one for the descriptions given. Concept C should have a score of zero for evaluation criteria, uh, six for parking. Uh, Michael, do you want to start? Sure. So, uh, yeah, the so the the criteria that we we used is is you know the neutral um, versus a minus one. Uh, part of that is we're we are removing parking along half the corridor, and uh, and so we didn't see that as a as a as an added benefit, which would be a you know a plus one, um, and so that that was really the me the reasoning behind that. Um, we and also we are still you know, we are still working through uh, you know the location of parking. Uh, we have we have turn lanes, transition areas. So uh, so we just wanted to be conservative in that because we don't honestly we don't know the exact number yet. Uh, we have a good idea, but the um, the valuation criteria is meant to show when we're if we're taking something away. Uh, that's why it's scored as minus one. Yeah, and and just to add. Uh, the, um, the, the scoring is not weighted, uh, so that, um, you know, we tried to reflect if we take some parking away or all parking away, uh, we would, um, evaluate that kind of, in a, in, for example, concept C takes approximately 300 spaces away. We rated that as, as less, uh, onerous thing, say concept A, which takes all of the concept, uh, all of the parking away. So we didn't weight the uh, evaluation criteria. We wanted to kind of see where the chips fall, uh, as, as far as um, and 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 we also looked at the the, the total numbers. Um, so we wanted to see which alternatives really uh, were in the negative territory versus in the positive territory. Thanks, Eric and Michael. The evaluation criteria do not consider the effect of each of the proposals on traffic flow overall in Northwest DC, nor the if effect of the commuter cut through traffic streets closely parallel to Connecticut Avenue, such as Albemarle 30th in Nevada. Uh, I'll start and Michael can continue. Uh, the traffic analysis did look at um, 24 intersections in the primary study area, and it looked at 20 intersections uh, within the the secondary study area. So we did do a a traffic flow, a capacity analysis uh, within. If you remember the uh, the map of the primary and secondary study area, um, about 44 intersections within both areas. So uh, we did looked at diversion, and Michael might want to talk a little bit more about diversion. Hello. Uh, so, yeah, we we did we did uh, evaluate. Um, really, I mean, you, you know, there's two. There's really two factors when we're talking about operations along the corridor. There's your uh, there. There is a commuter aspect that's that's the through traffic, and and that's really when we talk about reduced capacity along the corridor. Uh, that's where that would be impacted uh, primarily, and that's why we have, as Ed mentioned, we have uh, diversion associated with that. Um, and we and, and we'll we'll get more into uh, diversion and our results of our analysis uh, in the uh, in the next learning room with traffic and as well as the the, the general presentation. Um, and then the second the second part of that is uh, is at an intersection level, and that's where we looked at uh, as I mentioned 44 intersections. Uh, so some of that is uh, is uh, cross traffic local locally generated traffic. Uh, so it's really, you know, it, it's it's a it's definitely a a, a mix of uh, of both users. Uh, it, you know, you also have um, uh, you have you know, as we mentioned, we have diversions along uh, both quarters, and we're gonna, we we looked at the impacts of those uh, diversions uh, to the secondary study area, as well as the capacity reduction along uh, Connecticut Avenue, as part of our analysis. Yeah, and I think what you'll see in the next learning room is that, um, you know, concept B reduces the overall number of lanes in the Connecticut Avenue corridor by 1 and concept C reduces the number of lanes by 2. And uh, we'll show you in the next learning room 
uh, the result of the diversion analysis and roughly, I think, um, and, and I'll state it now, but we'll go into it more later. Uh, and that's, uh, we have about 3000 vehicles per day that would uh, divert under concept B and about 7000 vehicles per day that would divert uh, under concept C, but we'll, we'll go into that a little bit more uh, in the next the, in the following hour. Thanks, Ed. Thanks, Michael. Next question. Was there any coordination with traffic planners and public safety in neighboring Maryland communities, which are the source of most of the commuter traffic on Connecticut Avenue? Uh, we've been in touch with Montgomery County uh, and advised them of our study. Um, uh, I think um, once we determine which way we want to go in terms of concept B or concept C or the no build, uh, we'll then have further discussions uh, with uh, the adjacent jurisdictions. Thanks, Ed. Next question. Was there any coordination with MPD and other policy ag policing agencies, as well as DC Fire and uh, DC Fire and EMS, all of whom operate and are responsible for enforcement on uh, Connecticut Avenue? Uh, yes. Yeah, so, yeah, we we, we had a um, an interagency task force. Uh, I would say of about almost fifty people. Uh, and uh, MPD and, and fire and emergency services are part of that interagency task force. Yes. Thank you. Next question. Far side bus stops will back up traffic when the bus stops uh, to pick up or drop off riders. What will happen to stop traffic that is stuck in the near side intersection? Sure. I'm going to uh, uh, Johannes. Uh, if you're available and also uh, Anne Marie. So, Johannes, you want to go first? Yep, I'll go first. Uh, so, that's um, a very general statement, and not all far side stops would necessarily uh, create that condition. It'll be based on looking at each individual stop and designing them um, according to the analysis for that stop. And that's going to be largely based on what concept is selected. Um, we're going to have different stop designs based on if concept C or concept B or, or another concept is selected. So um, each stop will have to be evaluated once we get to that part of, part of the design phase. Thanks, Johannes. Uh, Anne Marie, did you want to add anything? If not, I think we can go on to the next question. In Okay, thanks, Ed. Do you have do any of these options address excessive speed through traffic, such as by deployment of speed cameras or via additional enforcement? Currently, it, currently it appears that very few motorists are penalized for dangerous excessive speed. Uh, so, two thoughts. One is that one of the recommendations uh, is to reduce the speed along the avenue, the posted speed along the avenue. Uh, from 30 to 25 miles per hour. Uh, so we've determined from a traffic engineering standpoint that, that that's possible, we can do that. Uh, secondly, once we do that, and I think we can do that before any uh, of the, the larger concepts might be deployed, either concept B or concept C, uh, we could put those posted speed limits, uh, the reductions in place, and then uh, wait, wait, you know, um, six months or so, and then we would uh, work with our uh, enforcement uh, folks and, and, and look for, I think uh, we would look for one or two locations along the corridor where we might be able to deploy speed cameras. Thanks, Ed. I have one uh, question I need to actually, over, I overlooked it was actually number one question. If concept B doesn't meet multimodal and safety goals, then why is it still being entertained? Um, some compromise with buffers is better than completely ignoring the bike slash pedestrian safety. Well, we're taking all alternatives to the public meeting. So no alternatives um, are officially dropped uh, at this time. I think um, uh, once we hear comments from, from the public uh, and the agencies as a result of public meeting number one, uh, we can make a decision about which alternatives to um, uh, to eliminate. But I think uh, all alternatives um, uh, are being brought forth um, uh, to, to the public meeting so we can make a, a decision, an agency decision, um, once the meeting is completed. 
Thanks, Ed. What period of time does your crash stats cover, statistics cover? Was it independently val validated by MPD? Well, uh, I'll start and Anne-Marie may want to continue. Uh, our crash statistics are for the last five years. So from 2015 through uh, 2019, so five year period. And they are uh, police, as Anne-Marie said, we had 1,507 police reported crashes in the Carter. So that's about uh, 300 uh, crashes per year. So uh, yeah, all of the, the crash statistics are from uh, MPD. Uh, and in addition, um, our safety consultant um, uh, looked at, actually read the narratives from the police report. So not only did we just look at the numbers, we read the narratives. And that's how we came up with the, the conclusions about the, the confusion with the, uh, the reversible lane systems. Anne-Marie, would you like to add anything? If not, we can go on to the next question. Uh, yes, um, I wanted to add that, you know, when we went through each of the police reports, uh, you know, we looked at not only confusion with reversible lane, but we also looked at other crash types as well uh, to determine crash patterns so that we can, as we move forward to the design phase, we can integrate uh, sometimes, you know, other type of safety improvements as we go. Thank you. I'm going to turn it over to Charlotte. She has a question. Yes, Ed, we have another question that came through. Is the existing tree canopy retained for all options? I don't think we've gotten that far yet. We haven't done any conceptual design or or 10% um, design, but uh, I think as we we stated um, all work, any changes uh, to either concepts B or C uh, would be within the 60 foot curb to curb width. Michael, do you have any other thoughts? No, nope, that's exactly what I was, I was going to say the same thing. All right, thank you. Next, Next question. Yep. Okay, Shaw, do you want to ask the next one or do you want me to go ahead? Go ahead. Okay, what is the process for final selection and approval of a concept? Does this require council approval? And uh, the third part to that is what is the time frame? Sure, and, and, and we'll get to that a little bit uh, more in the, in the main public meeting, but basically uh, the project is not funded for design or construction. Uh, DDOT uh, staff, our staff, once we uh, collate all of your comments, uh, we will develop a, a Rec staff level recommendation and take that up through the leadership of, of, of DDOT. Uh, once DDOT leadership um, uh, makes a decision, um, it'll then go to the mayor's office uh, for consideration. And then ultimately, uh, uh, we would need funded by, uh, funding by the council as well. So, um, as I said, their project is, is not either, in, it's not in design and it's not in construction. It's not funded at this time. Thanks, Ed. The next question uh, from Facebook, how will commuter motorists be notified of the infrastructure changes once the decision is made? Well, I think once the decision is made, we'll place everything on our website. Uh, we would um, uh, promote it through uh, social media. Uh, and um, I, I think, um, um, we would uh, promote that in any capital improvement uh, plan in, in, term, in terms of trying to determine if we have funding or not. So, um, so step one is basically making the decision. Uh, step two is uh, we would have another public meeting. We're, we're contemplating another public meeting probably in the fall uh, with either uh, uh, going uh, with additional design, a concept design for concept B or C uh, or the no build. Uh, so we're going to see where what happens, but basically, once we make a decision to go forward, we're going to do a little bit more design, uh, lay out the corridor a bit, um, and then uh, come to a stopping point until uh, we have uh, funding to proceed or not. Thanks, Ed. The next question, what provisions in this study will be made for the fact that at present, the total volume of traffic is significantly reduced, but may 
resume at a level under the uh, undetermined at this time. So will this project be paused until more accurate uh, evaluation that the traffic volume will be when commence, I'm sorry, when pre post COVID levels resume? Uh, we're, um, uh, we're gonna get more into this uh, whole question uh, in the next learning room in the next hour. But um, just uh, in, in summary, uh, our numbers do not take into account the fluctuations of uh, traffic volumes on a year to year basis. We look at the year 2045 horizon traffic volumes. Uh, we look at uh, the components of, of our analysis. We look at the employment and population and land use and zoning. Uh, uh, basically numbers that are that are 25 years into the future. So we're not looking at, you know, the vagaries of of of, of traffic volumes on a year to year basis. And, and certainly um, well, we don't know what's going to happen post pandemic. Uh, but, um, you know, we're making uh, some judgments based on on what we think might occur within uh, a 25 year period. And we'll get into more. We'll get into this a bit more uh, into the next learning room. Thanks. Eric. Since, since both concepts B and C have the same score, how will DDOT choose between the two? Uh, so it's not going to be just a, a, if you're a plus five or a plus four, we don't look at it that. We, we really look at um, uh, the merits of, uh, uh, are, are the concepts in accordance with the city plans, uh, the vision, uh, the DDOT's vision, uh, the vision of the District of Columbia, we also look at the comments that come in and, and we're, so we're asking you to provide us with comments, you know, over the next 30 days uh, on what your initial thoughts would be. Um, do you want the no build alternative? Do you want, uh, uh, do you want to see concept B or C or something else? So we'll, we'll look at all of your comments. We're going to look at the consistency with the, the district's plans and also what, what you think. And then we're going to try to make the best judgment that we can, um, uh, you know, after uh, in, in the next month or two. And then if we, I'm sorry. No, go ahead. Uh, I was just going to, I was just going to follow up on and just say that, you know, we, we went through the evaluation um, review and, and the reason why we moved the two concepts that we did forward is because they scored positive in that matrix. If, if there were four concepts that scored a plus four, we would have uh, continued to evaluate all four. It, it was really, uh, but, but, you know, in more detail, but that was really the purpose of the evaluation matrix to see which concepts really rose to the top over the other ones. Thank you, Michael. Thanks. Next question. What is the purpose uh, intended for the removal of parking for cars when so many locals and visitors need to be able to park if they arrive in this area by car? Uh, I don't think, um... It's not the purpose. It's it's what can we do within the sixty foot curb to curb width? You know how much, how much space do we have to accommodate all of the needs in the corridor? And uh, you know we want to hear your vision. You know what do you want to see Connecticut Avenue look like? Do you want to see parking? Uh, do you want to see a bike lane? Do you want to see the reversible lanes removed? Uh, do you want to accommodate pedestrians uh, and trucks and buses? So we have many many. Uh, conflicting uh, uses and users, and um, I, I should say that that our Move DC, uh, our long range plan, you know, has identified uh, Connecticut Avenue as a, a bike priority uh, corridor, uh, but that's not set in stone. We need to look at the engineering. We need to hear from you, uh, and we need to see look at the feasibility of, of each of the the concepts before rendering a decision. So uh, it's not parking or bike lanes or, or, you know, we're, we're looking at the totality and your vision, you know, of what the avenue should look like in the future. Thanks, Ed. This question almost uh, piggybacks on your uh, answer. Has your team looked into whether the Vision Zero Omnibus Amendment Act of 2019 would apply here, particularly sections 5B, which says DC has to build bike lanes when we build in the street, if bike lanes are present in a long range plan? Well, certainly vision zero is 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 part of uh, and the act uh, is part of um, of the decision making process. So again, it's not the only piece. Um, uh, your comments uh, will help craft our, our final decision. 
Uh, but it's certainly, um, you know, we want to make sure that the project is in accordance with the vision uh, uh, of the District of Columbia. Next question. Will either plan have an impact on the side access streets in Cleveland Park? Will they become pedestrianized? Uh, I'll talk about the side streets. I didn't hear the second part of your question. Will they become pedestrianized? Well, um, we will look at the side streets. If, um, again, if concept B uh, is selected, then, then, you know, parking is not an option. There's no parking spaces, relatively no parking spaces that are taken. I think only 21 spaces. If concept C is selected, we are, I think we would want to look at the side streets. And we would want to look at the parking on the side streets, uh, determine uh, if the uh, present uh, uh, uses uh, and, and, and we get meters or residential parking spaces um, are appropriate and, uh, and see what the mix of parking should be uh, within Cleveland Park. So, you know, we know Cleveland Park has a loading problem. We know uh, other areas uh, have, have truck usage and we, we need to factor all of that into uh, uh, our final decisions. Thanks, Ed. Con under concept B, would any efforts be made to enable bus efficiencies and biker safety, e.g. encouraging use of side lanes for these modes of transit only? If so, what can you say about projected effort, it, projected effects of such changes? Okay, I'm gonna see if um, Johannes can um, start to answer that question. Johannes? Uh, sorry, I did not hear the question. No problem, I'll repeat it. Under concept B, would any efforts be made to enable bus efficiencies and biker safety, e.g. encouraging use of side lanes for these modes of transit only? If so, what can you say about projected effects of such changes? Yes, what, once a uh, concept is selected, we will work with uh, the project team to ensure that various tools from the bus priority toolkit are used to ensure that uh, bus operations and um, are improved and made safe um, with whatever concept is chosen. Thank you. Are you ready for the next question? Yeah, I, I just would add it's um, 553 and I, I don't know how many more questions you want to take uh, uh, before we start our closing uh, to get ready for six, the six o'clock learning. Room. Yep, and this is the last question. Okay. Okay. Yep, no problem. Next question is, is there some way to make the choice less binary? Option B and C seem to be rising to the top, but are very far starkly different in terms of what each values. Bike lanes for parking. How can we? How can the process work to find a compromise between the two? Um, I think concept C provides a compromise. All most of the other alternatives either have more traffic issues. Uh, and or some of the alternatives do not have bike lanes, some of them do. Uh, I think alternative C uh, provides kind of a, a, a midway point. Um, sure, parking, we are, uh, parking uh, is going to be eliminated under the bikeway concept, but we are providing parking in concept C on one side of the street. Some of the concepts, you know, would remove all parking and we certainly, um, that's one of the reasons why we've rejected um, or recommending rejecting some of the other, the other concepts. Um, we can certainly uh, just eliminate the reversible lanes if that's the, the vision of, of the community. Uh, but if the vision of the community and the vision of the district is, is more, uh, then we need to consider um, uh, a concept that, that might include the removal of some parking, retaining parking as well, and uh, perhaps uh, the inclusion of a bike lane. But I'm not making any judgments. Uh, DDOT is not making any decisions. We want to hear from you. Thanks, Ed. So, Ed, we will go into um, the closing and next steps. I just wanted to let everyone know that we do have your questions. And for those that were not answered, 
Um, we do have our next upcoming sessions, but we will also be publishing the questions and answers to those questions on the project website as well. Thank you, Charlotte. So to recap, and you're going to see that you, if you're still with us, you're going to hear uh, the same slides uh, at the seven o'clock hour and at the um, six o'clock hour and the uh, seven o'clock hour. But uh, so let me um, uh, uh, start our closing. There is a 30 day comment period. We'll collect your comments, uh, your formal comments over the next 30 days. Please send your comments through the title six form for documentation. This form is one of the key avenues through which DDOT documents your formal comments. The Title VI form will be automatically provided when you exit either the WebEx general public meeting or the topic specific learning rooms. Please click continue at the close of the meeting when the pop-up window appears. It will take you to the Title VI form. DDOT will also email the Title VI form after the meeting. You can access the Title VI form at the link shown in red. Uh, we will keep a record of the questions and answers noted during the meeting, and we'll publish those on the project website. This is a, a sample of the Title VI form. You can see the link in red. Uh, there's also a QR code, and you can scan that with your phone, and, and it would take you to, the, uh, uh, to this form. So what happens next? Uh, we'll be transitioning to the traffic analysis and parking learning room uh, starting shortly. Um, the next, uh, if you would like to uh, attend the traffic and analysis parking room, you'll be directed to the next learning room automatically. Just stay uh, where you are. If you have technical difficulties accessing the room, uh, please call the following number in red. That's 202-705-7859. Again, a contact information uh, shows Ed Stoloff, project manager, and Cynthia Lynn, deputy project manager. Denise Jackson is the DDOT Community Engagement Specialist. Uh, Charlotte Ducksworth is our uh, Community Engagement Specialist, as well as Ian Swain from the firm of Community ET. Again, thank you for attending uh, this uh, learning room, and uh, we will now uh, proceed to uh, the traffic and parking learning room uh, in about uh, uh, you know three or four or five minutes. So thank you again. We appreciate your attendance and look forward to your continued attendance in the next learning room. We are live. Uh, Molly, uh, is the screen showing? No. Uh, oh, is the 6 p.m. screen showing? No, it is not. It is not? Nope. Can you see the screen? Yes, we do, Ed. We're ready. All right. Thank you. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome uh, to the Connecticut Avenue Reversible Lane Operations and Safety Study. This is public meeting number one. Uh, you are in the 6 p.m. learning room. This is traffic analysis and parking. Uh, at 7 p.m., we'll enter our uh, general meeting. Uh, but for the next hour, we'll give a, a, a content presentation on traffic and parking, uh, and then we'll go into our general meeting. We're going to start now. Uh, Charlotte uh, Ducksworth is going to give you a little primer on, on the WebEx platform. Charlotte? Thank you, Ed. Um, and thank everyone um, for joining as well. Um, just a few WebEx control features. Um, please note that this is an open meeting, and as required by DC Code 2578, this meeting is being recorded and will be made available to the public on our project website. 
Um, if you need technical support during this meeting, please call 202-705-7859. Next. Um, in terms of our audio and video, currently everyone is on mute and you cannot unmute yourself. Uh, we can unmute you during the Q&A and the comment period. Um, to request to speak, we will go over the raise hand feature in the next couple of slides. Your video camera is also off by default and you will not be able to share video um, so that we can maintain the bandwidth during the meeting. Next slide. Um, if you have a question during the presentation, send it via the Q&A feature. Um, to do that, click the question mark icon from the controls at the bottom of the browser window. A new panel will appear in the Ask field, select all panelists. Click the text box to type your question and press the enter key to send it. Next slide. So if you have called in um, and you cannot use the WebEx um, browser, please use your raise hand option on your telephone by dialing star three. Um, this will alert the project team that you would like to speak. Um, to virtually raise your hand via WebEx, click the three dot icon from the controls at the bottom of the browser window and select the raise hand option, which is the little hand. Next slide. Um, for our ASL interpreters, um, if you are viewing them, the best layout to view them is a side-by-side -side view. So in order to get to that view, click the layout icon located on the upper right-hand side of your main window. Um, the default view, of course, is typically stacked. You will select the side-by-side -side view, which moves the video to the right-hand side, and the ASL interpreter will appear in that larger box on the panel. Thank you, Ed. I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you, Charlotte. We're now going to do a little bit of an introduction and, and project overview. So let me introduce our project team. Uh, I'm Ed Stoloff, the DDOT project manager. Cynthia Lynn is our deputy project manager. Michael Glickman is our consultant manager from AMT. Charlotte Duxworth and Ian Swain, they are our public involvement consultants from the firm of Immune ET. Anne Marie Turner is our safety consultant from Sam Schwartz Engineering. We have a number of DDOT subject matter experts here this evening uh, from traffic engineering, Zushan Dang and Yi Zhao. Uh, active Transportation, George Branion, Mike Goodno, and Will Hansfield. Parking, David Litzcomb. Loading and Freight, Laura McNeil. Transit Priority, Megan Kanegi and Johannes Benhoff. And our Ward 3 Planning and Sustainability Representative, Ken Van Hooten. You're in uh, the Traffic and Analysis Learning Room. Um, we'll be here tonight from 6 to 7 p.m. The content includes slides that will be shown in the public meeting starting at 7 p.m. So there will be uh, some repetition. The learning rooms uh, provide participants with the opportunity to ask additional questions related to the specific uh, traffic and parking content area. In terms of our meeting agenda this evening, we'll go over uh, existing conditions and the project overview. Uh, we'll talk about uh, our evaluation of the concepts in terms of parking, uh, traffic, modeling, uh, diversions, and level of service, and we'll try to answer your questions uh, and comments and then close. The objectives of the learning room would be to identify the study goals and potential concepts that would fulfill the goals, to understand why the concepts or why the study is being completed, and to review our technical analysis for the no-build concept B and concept C. Uh, we'll let you know parking and loading uh, number of spaces that would be removed and retained under each concept. Uh, we'll give you a little bit of a primer on modeling and travel demand forecasting, our origin and destination data, and our projected volumes. We'll talk to you about traffic diversions, our assumptions, and our impacts to the primary and secondary study areas. And we'll go over the traffic analysis methodology, our level of service results, and conclusions. The project goals, uh, they're threefold. One, uh, to reduce uh, vehicle crashes and improve safety for all users. Two, to consider a protected bicycle facility. And three, uh, to assess the feasibility of removing reversible lane operations. The map that you see in front of you on the left is our study area. Uh, the study area extends from Legation Street on the north the Calvert Street on the south. We're studying 24 intersections within that uh, primary study area. 
Uh, the red that you see is our secondary study area. And the secondary study area extends from Western Avenue on the north, Mass Avenue on the west, DuPont Circle on the south, and Broad Branch Road and Beach Drive on the west. On the right, you see a map that shows the Connecticut Avenue corridor in the regional context. Just to give you a little bit of uh, understanding of, of Connecticut Avenue, uh, it's a principal arterial. Uh, the speed limit is currently 30 miles per hour. The curb to curb width includes 60 feet, and that's six lanes. The daily traffic volumes range from 24,000 near Calvert Street and 32,000 near Porter Street. The corridor that we're looking at is 2.7 miles. In terms of parking regulations and supply, we have about 609 parking spaces in this 2.7 mile corridor. About half of those spaces are unregulated. That means parking is allowed at all times of the day. No parking would be allowed in the AM and the PM peak hours. The other half of the spaces are regulated. They're either two hour parking spaces or two hour or three and a half metered parking spaces. We have 24 loading spaces in the corridor. In terms of origins and destinations, there's a lot of information on this map, but the, the one takeaway that I wanted to uh, show you is that through traffic. Through traffic in the corridor, depending upon which section of the corridor you're looking at, is about 40 to 50%. Uh, and through traffic, what we, what we mean by through traffic that's traffic that has neither origin or destination in the corridor. There, it's pass through traffic. In terms of average daily traffic volumes, Connecticut Avenue, as you can see, ranges from about 30 to 30 to 32,000 in the mid section to the northern section of the corridor and about 24,000 uh, near Calvert Street. As you can see, Wisconsin Avenue and Mass Avenue has about an equal number of vehicles per day. 28,000 in Wisconsin uh, and about 28,000 in Mass Avenue. All of the numbers I should say are pre-COVID numbers. Now this graph, what this graph shows you, it's a segment from Van Ness Street to uh, Tilden Street. And uh, this shows you our traffic counts that we took uh, pre-COVID and the traffic counts that we took uh, in December, 2020 during the uh, COVID. And what this shows is that traffic uh, was down by, uh, by approximately half, 45 to 49 percent reduction in daily traffic volumes uh, between uh, pre-COVID and COVID conditions. And as you can see, if you look at the time of day, you can see the red line and the blue lines. They, they match pretty equally for time of day. It's just the amplitude uh, or the magnitude of traffic that, that is different, but it's pretty much uh, the same patterns for you know, 12 a.m. to 11 p.m. Michael? Thanks, Ed. Uh, so the, the next few slides will uh, we'll talk about the parking loading evaluation form for Concepts B and C. Uh, what we're showing here is a snapshot of the uh, parking impacts relating to, to uh, both concepts. Under Concept B, we remove uh, approximately 21 spaces in order to achieve uh, the 25 feet visibility at crosswalks to improve safety. Uh, concept C, we would remove parking and loading from uh, one side of Connecticut Avenue, and uh, this may alternate from, uh, from the uh, southbound and northbound side, but we are limited by that 60 foot curb to curb width. Uh, the results of the Concept C scenario are based on a uh, detailed look at the corridor, and we're going to get into some of that on some uh, subsequent slides, but you can see that uh, 288 spaces would be retained, 321 would be removed, uh, 18 loading spaces would be retained, and six loading spaces would be removed. Next slide, please. So understanding that concept C has a greater impact on, uh, on the corridor as compared to concept B, we developed some potential solutions uh, to increase parking and loading along the corridor uh, under this concept. Uh, the, um, the one item would be that the parking loading spaces would be signed for all day use. Uh, this provides a 17 and a half percent net gain in terms of availability of parking space hours. When you look at the current parking restrictions, uh, we would look to um, 
to modify uh, potentially or convert some exist existing spaces from uh, that are currently park parking and converting those to perhaps pick up and drop off or loading. Uh, we know that's a, a need for the corridor, so we would uh, we would uh, look at that. Um, we also are reviewing some of the uh, current alley access for loading and uh, loading and uh, an unloading for the businesses, and we would look at opportunities to maybe uh, make better utilization of that if it's not uh, currently uh, being properly utilized. Thank you. Next slide, please. So as I indicated on the first slide, we, we did a detailed review of the uh, entire corridor. Uh, we broke the uh, we broke the the 2.7 mile uh, corridor into 10 segments. Uh, what we're showing here is uh, segment one. Uh, each map shows provides an inventory of parking. Uh, those are the the, the large numbers uh, next to the, uh, the the colored spaces there. Uh, we show that uh, any spaces that would be removed or retained as a part of concept uh, B or C. And then the uh, maps also provide additional information just to provide some context uh, so you know where you are along the corridor. Uh, starting with this map, uh, segment one, uh, we can see that uh, concept uh, uh, C uh, would, would remove some uh, parking uh, to enable uh, left turns at, uh, at the approaches, there, there's transition areas, so those left turns would be impacted. We show uh, on the left side, that's an area under concept B and C where the uh, corner clearances would have to be improved in order to uh, obtain the 25 feet of visibility. Um, uh, next slide, please. This is the, the second segment uh, I'm showing you is between Ingomar Street and Fessenden Street. Uh, this one's uh, unique in terms of the corridor in that it contains a commercial loading area. Um, and uh, so we, what we're showing is uh, is the parking spaces to re be removed. You can see that uh, we've moved from one side uh, on the on the opposite side. The, the spaces are being removed are for corner clearances or for turn lanes. Uh, we're showing some opportunities that, that we may uh, look into for potential uh, conversion to loading or pick up drop off. Uh, we, this would be uh, on through all the commercial corridors where we would look at, at ways to improve on that. Uh, as uh, we go through the next slides, we, we'll, we'll just kind of cycle through them. I'm not gonna get into any more detail, but feel free to uh, ask questions as you see it, and we can answer it after the uh, presentation. You can see you'll see in some spots that that we we've shifted from the northbound to the uh, southbound side in order to maximize uh, the use of parking in those segments. Maybe the next segment shows that. And that's the end of our study here at Calvert. Uh, so what, uh, this, this slide is really just um, uh, a summation of, of, of what, what we just went through. The table on the left provides the total spaces. You see we have just over 600 spaces along the corridor, uh, approximately 24 spaces or 577 feet of loading. Uh, as I uh, referenced uh, on, the, on the initial slide, uh, if you look at the table on the right, um, Concept B would uh, this, the 21 spaces that are removed are for improvements to visibility at crosswalks. Uh, it's a safety improvement. Uh, uh, for concept C, it would, it would uh, lose uh, remove four, 321 spaces, retain 288 spaces. Uh, the the uh, one benefit of uh, of this scenario is we would retain uh, the majority of the loading spaces uh, along the corridor uh, under this scenario. Next slide, please. Thank you, Michael. Sure. I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, travel demand forecasting and, and modeling. Um, uh, 
I uh, just wanted to give you a sense of, of, of how we arrived, how we, we came up with forecast traffic numbers. Uh, number one, we, we did take uh, uh, traffic counts during pre-COVID conditions. And then we, we, we call, we, we calibrate our model. So we try to uh, have our model replicate the existing traffic counts. And we were successful in that. Once we do that, we, as I said in the last learning room, uh, we use the Metropolitan Washington Council of Governments land use and population uh, employment data to prepare no build traffic forecast models. Once we do that, uh, we can then use the model to vary the number of lanes. No change in the no build condition. Uh, under concept B, we have one lane reduction in the peak period peak direction. In concept C, we have a two lane reduction in the peak period peak direction. And what we do then is we build our 2045 traffic forecasts. Once we do that, it allows us to consider diversion, to look at diversion potential, to consider level of service. Uh, that's the capacity at intersections and how intersections operate. And then we also uh, look at the travel time, travel time changes between uh, the alternatives. And there are a number of limitations and assumptions in the traffic model. Uh, so we focused on concepts B and C, as I said, because it is sensitive. The model is sensitive to changes in the number of lanes. Models are good forecasting tools uh, for higher volume roads, but not as good on lower volume roads. Models do not consider uh, potential mode shifts that might occur in the study area such as additional transit or metro ridership. The model that we have do not, does not consider potential changes as more people might be working from home as a direct result of the dynamics created uh, by the pandemic conditions. And the study considers a year 2045 planning horizon and does not consider changes in traffic volumes uh, on a year-to-year -year basis. Uh, Michael is going to talk a little bit about traffic diversions. Uh, Michael. Uh, thanks. So the uh, daily traffic diversions were uh, were, were modeled uh, based on the 2045 uh, no build volumes. Uh, a portion of the diversions occur within the secondary corridors and others uh, routed get routed to regional uh, facilities uh, outside of the primary and secondary study areas. Uh, the daily diversions were then uh, distributed over the five hour weekday morning hour through the commuter hour and the five hour afternoon hours. Uh, so essentially your, your 24 hour volumes, uh, your diversion volumes are spread over 10 commuting hours where the remaining 14 hours would remain unchanged uh, because uh, during those times capacity hasn't uh, changed or the operations are, is consistent with what exists today. Next slide please. So what we determined was that 55 to 60 percent of the traffic diversions will occur within the secondary study area, while 40 to 45 percent will travel on regional roadways. Uh, regional diversions include uh, roads like George Avenue, Claire Bar Barton Parkway, Canal Road, I-495, MacArthur Boulevard, GW Parkway. Um, so this means that approximately 3,200 vehicle trips diverted under concept B. Uh, would route to the secondary study area and around 1200 would, would go to the regional roadways. Now under concept C, uh, we're essentially uh, more than doubling the diversions where we have uh, 3,900 trips going to the secondary study area and 3,100 using regional roadways. Next slide. Oh, I'm sorry, the chart on the right, it, it's really just, a, it, it kind of shows you how we, we take from our daily numbers and get to our individual uh, peak hour volumes on some of the key north south roads. Next slide. Uh, so this slide represents diversions graphically using uh, green lines to show decreases in volumes and blue lines to show increases in peak hour volumes. Uh, the line weights do not rep represent the total volume, but the relative increase or decrease as compared to the 2045 no build volume. Um, so, for instance, if you look at the graphic to the right, you see the weighted lines on the figure for concept C indicate how traffic is diverted from Connecticut Avenue to the adjacent um, 
north south roadways again those those line weights are really a relative impact to the to those roads it doesn't mean that more traffic is is necessarily diverted to those roads and again as i said uh, concept c diverts approximately uh, twice as much as concept b next slide please so uh, after we after we uh, performed the diversion analysis uh, we went ahead and compared um, the e each of the uh, the three conditions we analyzed for um, their proportion of cars versus other multimodal users. Uh, you can see the no build is uh, sixty one percent uh, gets slightly uh, of cars uh, versus uh, thirty nine percent are are uh, other users. Uh, concept B gets slightly better. Uh, mostly because the, the number of vehicles have decreased, which um, brings up the percentages of the other uh, use, uh, uses. And then finally with concept C, we, we drop about 10% uh, in terms of uh, that balance of cars to other users uh, from the no build condition. We also included a 2% modal shift, although the model does not, uh, does not include that in our analysis. Uh, we understand that there would be some modal shift that would occur along the corridor. Next slide, please. So now we're, we're, we're going to get into our actual analysis that we performed uh, at, at intersection level. Uh, so for those that are not aware of level of service, uh, it's a grading system from A to F based on vehicle delay through an intersection. An intersection operating at 55 seconds or better uh, would be considered, uh, uh, we would denote that uh, as a level of service D or better. An intersection between 55 and 80 would be E. And over 80 seconds would be F. Uh, anything at uh, E or F is considered operating in constrained conditions. Next slide, please. Uh, we're going to just uh, quickly just provide the details in terms of uh, some at a high level are the results of our analysis. Uh, it, this is the AM peak hour for the primary and secondary study area. If you look at the table, it shows that three to four intersections of the 44. Uh, are operating at level service F. Uh, the intersections that that, uh, that are of note would be um, Nebraska and Connecticut Avenue, Nebraska Avenue and Broad Branch, Beach Drive, and Tilden Street, and then Nebraska and Ward Circle North. Next slide. Uh, similarly, looking at the PM peak hour, and, and if you can draw your attention to the table, uh, four to five intersections operate at level of service. F uh, within both study areas. Uh, the intersections that are of note are Nebraska Avenue and Connecticut Avenue, and Cathedral Avenue and Connecticut Avenue in the primary study area. And then in the secondary study area, you'd have Western Avenue and River Road, Reno Road, Military Road, and Nebraska and Ward Circle. Next slide. Please. So, Ed, okay. Uh, Thanks, Michael. Um, I'm just going to go over a couple of the uh, traffic analysis conclusions uh, before we start our Q&A. So, level of service, capacity, and delay for concepts B and C do include diversions to the secondary study area and to regional roadways. Concept C diverts more traffic than concept D uh, due to one less uh, travel length. Concept uh, or the study area intersections with level of service F during the highest AM and PM peak hours uh, under 2045, no build conditions, three intersections in the morning, uh, five intersections in the PM. And as you can see, concepts B and C uh, during those peak hour periods are approximately the same. Delays would result in the overall intersection as well as the individual intersection approaches. The model diversions must occur for traffic operations to operate at acceptable levels of service for some intersections along Connecticut. In terms of uh, additional travel time uh, for concept B in the morning going southbound, that would be an additional three minutes. Concept C would be an additional seven minutes comparing uh, to our 2045 no build condition. Going northbound in the evening, concept B would increase travel time by four minutes and concept C would increase travel time by eight minutes. And that's compared to our no build condition in the year 2045. We did think about a what if analysis or a what if assessment. 
So what if the magnitude of AM and PM peak hour diversions are less than modeled? Again, intersection delay would increase, level of service F conditions might not be mitigated by signal timing adjustments alone, corridor travel times would be longer, and modal shifts and behavioral changes like more teleworking would need to occur. And what if concept B and C traffic volumes are 10% to 20% lower than we modeled due to modal shifts or behavioral changes such as increased teleworking? Intersection level of service would improve, harder travel times would improve, and there would be less diversions. I think uh, I'm going to turn this over to uh, Charlotte and Ian uh, for our question and comment moderation. Uh, Charlotte? Hi, Ed, thank you very much. We will go ahead and get started um, with our first question and just wanted to let everyone know if we don't get to your question, um, we will also be publishing the questions and answers to those um, on, the on the website as well. Thank you. Ian, can you go ahead and start? Yes, thanks, Charlotte. Thanks, Ed. The first question, why doesn't the study area extend to the Maryland border and south to DuPont for that matter? Thank you, Ian. Um, uh, our study area, I guess, does extend to DuPont Circle. So um, in our secondary study area, it does extend to DuPont Circle. Uh, when we, um, uh, the ANCs provided us with a, a resolution in 2018, uh, we considered um, uh, what the ANCs were asking for and, and the predominant issue at the time uh, were, were twofold. One, uh, looking at um, uh, the reversible lane system and the reversible lane system extends from Legation to Calvert Street and that's 2.7 miles. We then wanted to consider uh, a potential uh, bicycle facility. And so that potential bicycle facility was included uh, in um, uh, in that 2.7 mile corridor. I should say that um, during our stakeholder presentations over the last year, uh, we have been asked to reconsider the study area. And if concept C uh, or, or a concept with a protected bicycle facility was uh, uh, is, is, is recommended, uh, we would consider, DDOT would consider extending the study area uh, to the north, maybe not all the way to the circle, but perhaps to uh, maybe just south of, uh, of Northampton Street. So again, uh, we won't make that decision uh, until we we make a decision on on the global uh, uh, concept. Thanks, Ed. Next question: The speed limit is 30 miles per hour. What is the actual average speed? I suspect it's much higher. Drivers go way too fast on Connecticut Avenue. Um, anecdotally, uh, that's what the public. I I agree. Um, with the uh, uh, the individual, um, anecdotally, uh, that's what we have heard uh, time and time again from from the public. So yes, uh, when we actually took our speed counts, um, our speed counts uh, averaged right right at thirty or below. And keep in mind, um, I think what what uh, people see are are maybe cars uh, racing um, up and down the avenue. Uh, but 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 when we did our uh, and again it's not all cars so when we did an average it it kind of um, meshes together uh, but um, uh, certainly um, uh, we've heard anecdotally that um, uh, speeding is an issue and I think that's why what I've said in the the previous learning room uh, is that uh, once we we um, uh, reduce the speed on Connecticut Avenue to 25 miles per hour uh, and let the public uh, um, Find out how that works. We would then look at one or two locations along the corridor where we would uh, consider uh, speed enforcement, uh, automated speed enforcement. Thanks, Ed. Is there available data on how many households on slash near the corridor have available off-street parking? I don't have that information in front of me now, um, uh, but we will um, uh, work uh, to uh, to find that information. Next question, would concept C add 24 hour PUDO in areas where it does not currently exist today? If so, where would that be? I would say that we're not, we would, we're not at that level yet. Uh, we would have to get to additional um, uh, conceptual engineering. And so the mix of, of 
of spaces, be it uh, handicapped spaces, be it uh, um, pick up drop off spaces or loading spaces would not be determined until we would meet with the businesses and meet with uh, uh, the residents to see uh, what the what the best mix of, of parking would be. And I guess um, I want to um, ask, I think David Litscombe uh, uh, of parking and ground transportation is in the uh, as a panelist. David, do you have any other thoughts? Um, no, and I'll just say that uh, I think you um, got it right there. You know, <clears throat> excuse me, we're not quite at that level yet. Um, but as we move through uh, getting this public comment and as we close in on what the final state's going to be, um, balancing the various curbside needs will be one of the key things that we do. And uh, Pudo zones would certainly be a consideration there. Thank, Thank you, David. David. Yeah. Next question here. Uh, why is the intersection visibility clearance only 25 feet? The regulations now indicate the new standards are 40 feet. I think Anne Marie answered that on uh, Monday. Anne Marie, would you like to uh, uh, talk about that uh, now? Sure. I think it's just the way that it's communicated here. Um, so the intersection clearance in, with the 25 feet includes the crosswalk. So if the crosswalk is 15 to 20 feet, the 25 would go beyond that. So uh, each intersection would have a clearance in excess of 40 feet. Thank you. Thanks, Emily. Thanks, Ed. Next question. How will, and this is a, a duplicate question, uh, Ed, that we had from the previous uh, learning room. How will DDOT choose between either concepts B or C? Can you elaborate on that again? Sure. Uh, I think what I said is, is, is the decision uh, or the recommendation, I should say, uh, is uh, will be based upon the, the uh, vision uh, of the of the District of Columbia, the the vision and mission of of uh, the uh, Department of Transportation (DDOT). Um, we're going to look at all of the comments that we get um, in terms of um, the stakeholders in the corridor, and we're going to lay everything out and and um, uh, make a decision based upon I think. Um, all of the comments as well as the, the mission and vision of the district and, and DDOT. Thanks, Ed. I think this question is going to be for you and Michael. If concept C causes a 17.5% gain in parking availability, why not always display those numbers with the reduction in parking spots? That's a big advantage in availability. One can easily argue that concept C provides more time for parking. Uh, so let me clarify that. Um, Again, that would be a, when we say gain, that would be if we have parking uh, and we basically allow parking where parking is restricted today, that would give us additional space hours. You know, in terms of additional, you know, 25 hours a week, it would give us another 25 hours of spaces, you know, per space um, uh, that, that's, that's on the block phase. So uh, that's about 17 and a half percent. But still, um, I have, you know, even though we have that, we're still removing. 300 spaces along the corridor under concept C. So we're increasing the number of space hours on the sides of the, on the block faces where we're retaining parking, but we are, as you know, um, uh, would be reducing parking on the other side of the street. Michael, do you have anything to add? Yeah, only that, uh, you know, the, 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 the time periods where, you know, we, we, we wanted, we were, we were aware that. Uh, that this is a net gain throughout the day, but during certain periods, other, you know, others may see that as, as still a loss. So we didn't want to overstate uh, that fact, but we did include that on, on numerous slides, I believe. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Michael. How many residents along the corridor own cars versus the total number of residents? And why are the car free residents uh, required to subsidize? The choices of the car owners. I'm not sure we have that data, but that's the question. No, I, I don't have that data, but I think um, uh, the answer is uh, uh, that um, uh, we're looking at the values. Everyone has different. All of our stakeholders have different values in the corridor, uh, and and we'll be looking at um, all of the values of the state of all stakeholders. And we know some of the, uh, the values are conflicting, but we're going to look at uh, the needs of all of the stakeholders. And make a decision based on the vision uh, uh, of the District of Columbia. Thanks, Ed. Next question: um, Aren't there plenty of uh, 
parking spaces available in this corridor, for example, the shopping center at Cleveland Park Metro. So in our analysis, have we been able to determine that there's enough parking spaces along the corridor? Uh, our analysis um, did look at um, uh, surface lots uh, uh, within the corridor, uh, not every surface lot because there's, you know, there are many, many surface lots uh, in, behind the residential condos and apartment buildings. Uh, and there's garages um, uh, in the area as well, but but we did look at um, you know, within the the commercial nodes, the commercial areas. Um, there are certainly uh, 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 off street parking in the Van Ness area. Uh, there's some off street parking in Cleveland Park, uh, but there's there's little off street parking in, in the Woodley Park area. So you know we're looking at every commercial node. Uh, we're looking at the we'll be looking at the off street parking as well as the on street parking requirements. Uh, to try to serve um, uh, the, the the uses as as best we can, uh, given the uh, concept that 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 uh, would be selected. Thank you. Is Connecticut Avenue? Uh, this question may be for Amory. Is Connecticut Avenue considered high or low volume? Uh, I I don't uh, think that's a. I, I think that's a question that. Um, uh, everybody will have a, a, a different answer. Connecticut Avenue is a principal arterial. It's an evacuation route. Uh, it um, uh, has volumes that um, it's, it's certainly it's six lanes uh, of traffic. And I think um, uh, the traffic, uh, the capacity, the traffic basically is less than capacity at at most times of the day. And I think um, as our level of service analysis showed, um, uh, there are certain intersections that that over capacity that that back up uh, and we're aware of those intersections. Uh, but I think um, uh, to use the term high or low, that's, um, you know, it's, it's really based on the functionality of, of the road and Connecticut Avenue is a principal arterial. Thank you, Ed. Uh, why is DDI still using uh, antiquated and car focused LOS matrix? Um, I will let Michael and, and maybe E would like to um, uh, talk about that a little bit, but uh, let me just start. Uh, uh, level of service is the accepted um, uh, uh, methodology uh, in the traffic engineering profession um, to grade kind of and to look at uh, to look at how an intersection operates. Uh, certainly, there are other ways to look at um, uh, the operations of a road and the operations of. of Multi modes within a corridor, but level of service is one of the standard methodologies that traffic engineers use. Uh, uh, let me go to E. E, would you have any follow up with that? Hi, Ed. I, I think you're right. And uh, actually, the LOS is developed by the uh, just traffic engineering field and uh, well accepted by the, the, the either communities. And the, uh, the, the, the national wide this acceptance uh, and uh, that's why I think uh, as um, it's just mentioned, it may not be the, the best uh, just matrix that for this particular project, but um, based on, on all the uh, information we have, and this is the one like we think it's best used for uh, that that DDoT can 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 use this give it a uh, relatively um, good output and and a fair compar comparison yeah thank you thank you there are many public and private schools along Reno Road and high traffic for them is from 7:30 a.m. to 9 a.m. Why do you spread your diversion analysis over five hours? This seems unrealistic. Actually, the diversion is spread over uh, 10 hours. Uh, Michael, that's correct, right? Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and I think, um, let me just finish and, and then you can, can add. Um, um, the diversion uh, that we looked at uh, uh, takes the daily number and we break that down into the number of cars that might be coming down Reno Road or any road, actually, um, during each hour that we, where diversion would take place. So really, I think we're saying six to um, uh, 
for example, six to 11 in the morning. And then when traffic, uh, the PM starts up again, it would be from you know, three to eight uh, in the afternoon. So we look at the highest number, but there's also diversion that would occur in those, those other uh, AM hours and the other PM hours. Uh, Michael, would you like to continue? Yeah, only that we, you know, when we did, we do our, we did traffic counts, uh, we collected data pre COVID. Uh, there was, so we, we do know daily variations. Uh, so we can see how during peak hours traffic uh, gradually uh, goes from, you know, it starts to build uh, at, at a certain point and then it starts to die down at a certain point. And uh, so the, the, the five hours really captures the majority of the peak hour traffic. And when we talk about that spread over five hours, it's, it's not, it's proportionally spread out. It's not, it's not divided by 10. So when we, we, we did it, we developed those diversion um, distribution based on the, the daily variations that are already occurring along the corridor. Thanks, Ed. Thanks, Mike. The next question is, how does DDOT characterize these traffic and diversion estimates under concepts B and C respectfully? Are the minor manageable significant extremes? So are the concepts or, or the traffic uh, characterizations Minor, manageable, or significant, lastly, extreme. I think we characterized it early, and, and Michael can continue, continue and, and E as well. But I think we characterized it as manageable uh, in our past meetings with our stakeholders. Uh, uh, we looked at uh, the level of service uh, and we looked at the capacity of the intersections with the diversions, and we found that um, you know up to five intersections. Uh, within the primary and secondary study area, um, well, I would say uh, probably 39 out of the 44 intersections operate without issues, and there's about four or five intersections that would operate uh, even with the diversions um, uh, in in a, in a manner that we would have to look at where you know just signalization options would not uh, mitigate uh, the issues. So, again, um, uh, E or or Michael, would you have anything to add? Um, no, Ed, that, that, that covers it. Thank you. And I'm going to ask uh, one other question and then Charlotte's going to jump in. We have a caller with a question as well. Uh, the next question is, is the study group familiar with the rush hour traffic on Connecticut Avenue in Maryland between Chevy Chase Circle and East West Highway? This is an area of reduced lanes. The rush hour traffic is a nightmare. How would Connecticut Avenue traffic in DC be different? I think our traffic forecast um, uh, shows uh, uh, what what the uh, how Connecticut Avenue would operate under concepts B and concept C, and I think um, uh, what we've shown is, as I just said, uh, about five of our our um, four to five of our forty four intersections in our primary study area uh, would have issues that we would need to resolve either uh, through additional uh, modal modal change or additional uh, teleworking or, or, or other mode shifts. Uh, uh, but I think, um, uh, we characterize it as, 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 uh, four or five intersections that, that would have issues. Uh, Michael, anything to add? Yeah, only that, you know, we, obviously our study doesn't go into Maryland. So the, what, what's causing congestion in, in, in Maryland, uh, really, as you head into, into the district, the, the lanes open up. So. Uh, even under uh, concept C, you would not reduce lanes from from what's occurring in Maryland. Uh, but yeah, we we uh, we can only we can only we only know that based on anecdotal uh, discussions. But uh, but it, but essentially, you know, there the diversion accounts for people in Maryland making decisions at that point uh, prior to entering our study area. Uh, so they might use regional roadways if you're far enough north in Maryland. Uh, this this the version may go to I four ninety five versus four or as you're heading further south, it it may use with it, vehicles may use Wisconsin. Um, yeah, 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 I would say generally there's a concept that that we follow and and it's called equilibrium, and that is that um, you know if if you have to sit for too long uh, in um, you know in, in traffic, you will uh, use another uh, route, and I think. Uh, even with technology today, people are, are using Google and, and other 
forms of technology to you know set their route even before they leave home. Um, okay. Yeah. Thanks, Ed. Thanks, Michael. I'm going to turn it over to Charlotte. Hi, Ian. Thank you. Um, we have a Mr. Gabrielle on your door. I think I'm saying that correctly. Um, that needs to be unmuted to pose his question. Um, this will be the last question. No, the question has already been answered. It was in the six o'clock section. Okay, thank you. So, Ian, we have time for one more question. Okay, let's see who's going to be the lucky person. Um, Huh. Uh, I'm going to ask a two part question because I'm combining two questions because I think the diversion is is a lot of we're getting a lot of question comments about diversion. So here's the question, uh, Ann and Mike. Uh, how might traffic uh, traffic affect diversion analysis to nearby roads, and, and how might such traffic affect diversion analysis to the other corridors or streets? So in other words, the analysis that we've done, how has it what are we doing to look at the nearby roads and their impact on that diversion? Uh, Michael, do you want to take that first? Yeah, sure. So, uh, so our study area is, is fairly comprehensive. We, uh, as noted, we, we looked at uh, 24 intersections along Connecticut Avenue, which does uh, capture the, the cross traffic impacts, the east west impacts. Uh, then we also looked at uh, 20 intersections in the second in the secondary study area, which includes roads like Broad Branch, uh, Beach Drive, uh, it includes Wisconsin, uh, Wisconsin Avenue, Massachusetts Avenue, Reno Road, uh, River Road. Uh, so we we and really uh, it, we go all the way to uh, Dupont Circle, so uh, to the south and and Western Avenue to the north. So we we when we initially scoped the project, we were trying to capture as much of that immediate uh, diversion area that, that we could. And, and so uh, when, we, when we shared our level of service analysis, it really, that, that fed our information, uh, fed us information in terms of how the diversions are impacting those secondary roadways. And uh, obviously we can't capture every single intersection in the analysis, but we, uh, we, def we looked at the key intersections, the ones that we knew uh, had, uh, had greater volumes in the secondary study area. And we're sick and, and had traffic signals. Thank you. Uh, Ed, thank you, Michael. Um, I was told to stop, so I'm going to stop and uh, I'm going to turn this back over to you. Ed. Uh, thank you, Ian. Thank you for your moderating. Uh, we're now going to start our closing. And again, uh, I apologize for the repetition for those that were in our previous learning room uh, and on Monday, but um, here it goes. Um, we will collect your formal comments uh, over the next 30 days. Please send your comments through the Title VI form for documentation. The form is one of the key avenues uh, through which DDOT documents your formal comments. The Title VI form will be automatically provided when you exit either the WebEx general public meeting or the topic specific learning rooms. Please click continue at the close of the meeting when the pop-up window appears, it will take you to the Title VI form. DDOT will also email the Title VI form to you after the meeting, and you can access the Title VI form at the link shown in red. We will keep a record of the questions and answers noted during the public meeting, and we will publish them to the project website. This shows a, you an example of the Title VI form, and you can see the link is in red, and in the right uh, side of the screen, uh, you can see a QR code. And if you scan your phone over that QR code, uh, you'll be able to access the Title VI form as well. So what happens next? Well, we wanna thank you for your attendance uh, during the learning rooms today. We will be transitioning into the general public meeting presentation. The next presentation will start just a couple of minutes after seven o'clock. If you would like to attend the general public meeting, uh, you will be directed automatically. So just stay in the room. If you have technical difficulties, please call the number in red, and that is 202 705 7859. Our contact information is on this slide. 
Again, I'm Ed Stoloff, the project manager. Cynthia Lynn is the deputy project manager. Bernice Jackson is our DDOT Ward 3 community engagement specialist. And Charlotte Ducksworth and Ian Swain are our community engagement specialist consultants from Commune ET. Again, we'll be going into our general public meeting uh, that follows in, in a couple of minutes. So thank you again for participating. Look forward to seeing you at 7 o'clock. We are live. Yes. If you could let me know if our uh, screen is being shared. Yes. Yep, we can yep. see it. All right, it's now 701 and we're uh, about to start uh, the general meeting uh, for the uh, uh, Connecticut Avenue reversible lane and operations and safety study. Thank you for joining us uh, this evening. We're going to get started right away. Uh, Charlotte uh, uh, Lux Duxworth is going to talk a little bit about the uh, WebEx uh, virtual meeting platform. Charlotte. Thank you, Ed. So welcome you all to our general meeting. Um, for today's uh, public meeting, this is an open meeting and as required by DC code 2578, this meeting is being recorded and the recording will be made available to the public on our project website. Um, if you need technical support during this meeting, please call 202-705-7859. Next slide. So we'll be going over some of the WebEx um, platform features. Um, Particularly on audio, you are on mute. Um, you cannot unmute yourself. We will unmute you during the Q and A and the comment period. Um, if you need to pose a question and you raise your hand, um, your video camera is also off by default and you will not be able to share video so that we can reduce the bandwidth during this meeting. Next slide. So, if you have a question during the presentation, send it via the Q and A feature. Um, if you've called in by telephone, we will discuss how you will actually raise your hand to pose a question. Um, for those on the WebEx platform, to send a question, click the question mark icon from the controls at the bottom of the browser window. A new panel will appear. In the Ask field, select All Panelists and click the text box to type your question and press the Enter key to send it. Next slide. Um, if you have called in and you need to pose a question, um, please use the raise hand option on your telephone by dialing star three. Um, to virtually raise your hand, click the three dot icon from the controls at the bottom of your browser window and select the raise hand option, which is the little hand that you see there. Next slide. Uh, we do have an ASL interpreter who joined us for the meeting. Um, so, in order to view them, click the layout icon located on the upper right hand side of your main window. Um, the default view is in stack view, so you can see them, but an easier view is the side by side view. So, when you go into the layout icon, click the second view side by side, um, which will move the ASL interpreter to the right hand side of your panel, and they will be in that larger box. Thank you, Ed. Thank you, Charlotte. We're now going to introduce our project team. Uh, I am Ed Stoloff, the uh, DDOT project manager. Cynthia Lynn uh, is our deputy project manager. Michael Glickman is our consultant project manager from the firm of AMT. Charlotte Duxworth and Ian Swain, they are our public involvement consultants from the firm of Commune ET. Anne Marie Turner uh, is our safety consultant from Sam Schwartz Engineering. We have a number of DDOT subject matter experts here this evening with us to help answer your questions. Uh, for traffic engineering, we have Zushan Dang and Yi Zhao. Active transportation, George Branion, Mike Goodno, and Will Hansfield. Parking, uh, David Litzcomb. Loading and freight, Laura McNeil. Transit priority, Megan Kanegi and Johannes Benhoff. And our Ward 3 Planning and Sustainability Representatives, Ed Van Hooten. In terms of our meeting agenda tonight, we're going to go over the uh, uh, overview of the project. We're going to talk a little bit about our public 
outreach to date, uh, the project background and existing conditions. Uh, we'll show you the alternatives that we have developed thus far. Uh, we'll talk about our first and several second level evaluations of concepts. Uh, we'll talk about safety and mobility, parking and loading, modeling, traffic diversions and level of service. And then we'll uh, conclude by answering your uh, questions uh, and then closing. The objectives of the meeting are to identify the study goals and potential concepts that may fulfill those goals, understand why the study is being completed, illustrate multimodal conditions, identify trade-offs, benefits, and technical issues associated with each concept, show why concepts B and C has risen to the top, and understand the traffic and parking impacts of each concept. Are there feasible alternatives, uh, design alternatives, or solutions that you believe DDOT may not have considered given the goals and guiding principles of this study? Please let us know. There are three project goals. One is to reduce uh, vehicle crashes and improve safety for all modes, to consider a protected bicycle facility, and to look at the feasibility of removing reversible lane operations. We show our study area maps. Um, the map on the left shows you our primary study area in blue, and uh, the study area to the north is uh, starts at Legation Street, and to the south, the study area ends at Calvert Street. That's the primary study area. The secondary study area uh, extends from Western Avenue to the north, Mass Avenue to the west, DuPont Circle to the south, Broad Branch Road, and and Beach Drive to the west. Uh, the map on the right shows you where Connecticut Avenue fits in in terms of the regional context. There are a number of project elements that we want to show you this evening. One is uh, we started out with data collection and analysis and existing conditions uh, last winter. We started to develop initial concepts in the spring and summer. Uh, we held a first round of stakeholder meetings in the summer. We then did our modeling and traffic analysis in the fall and our concept evaluation this winter. And uh, we had our round two stakeholder meetings in February. Right now in red, you can see we are at the public meeting. Uh, we held a first public meeting uh, on Tuesday, March 30th. And this is our second day of our public meeting on April 1st, 2021. Charlotte, would you like to talk a little bit about our uh, community engagement? Thank you, Ed. Um, so the community engagement has been a multi-pronged um, approach. We have implemented, of course, a community advisory committee. You see those members on, on the right-hand side of your screen, um, which includes um, different members from the ANCs, as well as our pedestrian advisory council member and our War 3 bicycle advocate as well. Um, we've had multiple stakeholder meetings, which you'll see um, on the next slide. We've had interagency meetings that have been critical um, that have involved other agencies outside of DDOT, um, such as DOEE, HSEMA, um, and multiple other um, agencies. Here's a sampling of several stakeholder meetings that um, we have held, which shows different civic groups um, and institutions, such as the, the National Zoo and others that have been part of this discussion as well. Next slide. Um, and here, of course, is our project email and the project website. Um, and as Ed mentioned, um, on the right-hand side, you see um, our project managers and our outreach team. So um, thank you for being a part of it. And our project website is updated all the time with information. Thank you. Thank you, Charlotte. I want to give you a little bit of background uh, in terms of prior studies. Um, uh, we've been talking about Connecticut Avenue reversible lanes for the last almost 20 years. Uh, in 2003, there was a Connecticut Avenue Cleveland Park traffic operations study. Uh, in 2011, the Institute of Transportation Engineers looked at reversible lane operations uh, in Washington, D.C., and, and, and especially on Connecticut Avenue. Uh, in 2014, Move D.C., and in 2021, uh, this year, our Move D.C. update identifies Connecticut Avenue as a bike priority corridor. Uh, and in 2016, there was a Cleveland Park bicycle analysis. And in 2018, there were three ANC resolutions uh, that uh, asked DDOT to uh, consider uh, uh, the potential removal of the reversible lanes and also to consider 
uh, a potential uh, mobility improvement, such as uh, uh, bicycle, protected bicycle lanes. Again, that was in the spring of and um, uh, the fall of 2018. And DDOT developed a request for qualifications for a consultant, and the community was extensively involved in shaping uh, that RFQ. Just wanted to uh, let you know the, the relationship between the Cleveland Park streetscape and drainage project uh, to this Connecticut Avenue reversible lane project. Uh, the projects are independent. Uh, the project is scheduled uh, to be advertised in fiscal year 2021 very soon. Connecticut Avenue is a principal arterial. It's a, it has a 30 mile per hour speed limit. The curb to curb width is 60 feet and includes six 10 foot lanes. The daily traffic volumes on Connecticut Avenue ranges from about 24,000 near Calvert Street to about 32,000 near Porter Street. In terms of parking regulations and supply, we have 609 parking spaces uh, in the corridor. About half of those spaces are unregulated. Uh, that's parking um, allowed all times of the day, except during uh, uh, AM and PM peak hours. Uh, the other half of the spaces, about 300 spaces or so, uh, are, are metered spaces, either two hour restricted spaces or two and a half slash uh, three and a half hour metered parking spaces. And again, we have 24 loading spaces within the 2.7 mile uh, corridor. In terms of pedestrians, um, we've heard from lots of folks uh, uh, in, um, in the community and they've uh, told us there are about five key is pedestrian issues in the corridor. One, cyclists and scooters and pedestrian conflicts on the sidewalks, pedestrian conflicts at bus stops, slower walkers need more time to cross the street, long pedestrian wait times, and vehicles not following pedestrian laws. In terms of bicycles, again, we talked about Connecticut Avenue being designated as a protected bicycle facility in Move DC. The bicycle level of stress along the corridor ranges from fair to poor. And as you can see with the, the numbers uh, uh, below the screen, the intersections with the greatest bicycle volumes run from Porter Street to Calvert Street. In terms of transit, we have uh, three Metro Rail Red Line stops in the corridor. Uh, we have the L1 and the L2 bus routes, the average daily ridership for the uh, uh, bus uh, L1 is about 800 and the L2 is around 3,500 uh, riders per day. There's about 50 bus stops along the corridor on both sides. The uh, peak hour peak direction uh, frequency of buses in the morning is about eight minutes and about five minutes in the evening. This slide shows you uh, uh, lots of percentages, but I'll just key on one uh, focus area and that's uh, through traffic. Um, the public uh, in many in many of our stakeholder meetings told us uh, we feel like there's so much commuter traffic uh, on the corridor. And I think our numbers uh, bear this out. There's 40 to 50 percent uh, of the traffic on Connecticut Avenue, and this is pre-COVID, um, is for from through traffic. And when I say through traffic, I mean traffic that has neither origin or destination in the corridor. It's just passed through traffic. Again, this slide summarizes existing traffic volumes. And as I said earlier, uh, Connecticut Avenue in the mid and, 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 and northern sections have around 30 to 32 vehicles per day and about 24,000 vehicles per day uh, on the lower portion of Connecticut Avenue. This slide shows you a sample uh, of traffic volumes taken before COVID. And then uh, in December, 2020, during COVID conditions. The red line shows you pre-COVID and the blue line shows you COVID conditions. And uh, I think what we found is that there's almost a 50% reduction uh, in traffic volumes on the avenue uh, between both conditions. You can see uh, the time of day curve and basically uh, uh, the curve itself is uh, uh, the pre-COVID and COVID curves kind of mirror each other, but the amplitude, the, the magnitude of the 
the traffic is about 45 to 49 percent different. Anne Marie is going to talk a little bit about our uh, safety and crash analysis. Anne Marie. Hello. Um, project team identified 1,507 police reported crashes during the five year study period between 2015 and 2019. Uh, the project team looked through each of the crash narratives and found that 401 of them resulted in an injury, 177 of those during reversible lane hours, 64 involved pedestrians, 20 of those during reversible lane hours, and 39 involved bicycles, uh, 11 during reversible lane hours. Next slide, please. Of the crashes that happened, Okay, 46% of total crashes happened during reversible lane hours. Uh, of those crashes, 36% or more than a third could be directly attributed to the reversible lane condition. What we saw was that vehicles tended to turn left out of the wrong lane or make U-turns from the incorrect lane. Overall, that constitutes 17% of the overall crashes on the corridor. Uh, when we look at crash rates compared to other corridors, uh, Connecticut Avenue had a um, higher crash rate than Ma Massachusetts Avenue and Wisconsin Avenue, but a lower crash rate than Georgia Avenue and Rhode Island Avenue. Next slide. Uh, taken all together, uh, three crash types uh, attribute, took up about three quarters of the crashes. So uh, left turn, crashes, about 32% of the crashes, side swipes, and rear ends. Thank you. Thank you, Henry. I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, the guiding principles of the study and some of our initial findings on the alternatives, and then Cynthia is going to talk about the alternatives themselves. So, uh, so some of the guiding principles uh, of the alternatives, number one, quality of life. Uh, we would like to be able to accommodate the needs of all people who live and work and shop and, and recreate in the corridor. Uh, we wanna reduce the number of crashes and fatalities. We wanna incorporate complete streets principles uh, to, re to reduce vehicle speeds in the corridor. Uh, we wanna look at traffic operations and mitigate traffic operations to the extent that we can. Parking and loading, pedestrians, bicycles, and transit are other guiding principles. And right of way and construction, we said that the alternative must be constructed within the 60 foot curb to curb cross section. So just a little summary of the alternatives uh, that we looked at. Well, DDOT started with four build concepts, concept A, B, C, and D, O, plus a no build concept. Uh, we received potential concepts from the public and from our community advisory committee, and that was concepts D1, D2, and E. What we found is that the no build concept, concept A and concept DO would require MUTCD compliant overhead signage and signals. And this is not supported by the Commission on Fine Arts or the State Historic Preservation Office. Alternative B and C appear to be rising to the top in terms of their potential viability. Alternative B removes the reversible lanes and does not contain a protected bicycle facility. Alternative C includes one-way protected bicycle lanes and removes reversible lanes. All alternatives include elements to improve safety and mobility, including far side bus stop relocations. And DDOT is recommending that we reduce the uh, posted speed along the avenue from 30 miles per hour to 25 miles per hour. Some of our findings is that it, it's difficult to meet the full purpose and need. If we remove the reversible lanes and accommodate some parking and loading and accommodate protected bicycle facilities, then the widths of the protected bicycle facilities and buffers would have to have dimensions would need to be reduced. If we provide for only the removal of reversible lanes, that's concept B, we are not accommodating multimodal and safety and accessibility goals. The no build management option does not appear to meet the purpose and need. It does not reduce crashes. It retains the reversible lanes 
does not meet the multimodal safety and accessible goals, accessibility goals and requires overhead signage and signals to be MUTCD compliant, which is not supported by the Commission on Fine Arts. Cynthia is going to talk in detail about the concepts that we looked at. Cynthia? Thanks, Ed. So the first concept we'll talk about is the no build management option. Um, this is similar to pre-COVID conditions where there's a reversible lane in TAC. Um, there is no upgrades to any overhead signals or signage. During the peak hour, there are four lanes inbound and two lanes outbound, and then the reverse in the PM evening. Uh, during off-peak hours, there are two travel lanes in each direction with parking on both the east and west sides of Connecticut Avenue. Uh, this option would include improvements to enhance pedestrian safety and access, and it is modeled as a baseline concept for us to compare other concepts to. Concept A retains the two-lane reversible lane system. This does require an upgrade to overhead lane use and signage and signals. Uh, during the peak hour, there are three travel lanes in the peak direction with one in the off-peak direction. Uh, during the off-peak periods, there would be two lanes in each direction. Uh, this does provide a protected bike lane on both sides of the street that is buffered. However, the trade-off would be that parking along Connecticut Avenue would need to be removed. Um, there would be around 600 spaces or so. Uh, concept B removes the reversible lane system entirely. During the peak hour, there would be three northbound lanes and three southbound lanes. During off-peak periods, two lanes in each direction with parking provided on both east and west sides. This option does not provide any protected bicycle facilities. And as in pre-COVID conditions, there would be parking allowed. Parking would be allowed, but only during off-peak periods. Next slide. This I should show a rendering of what concept B would look like if it was implemented. Uh, similar geometry to existing conditions without the reversible lane. Three lanes in each direction. Next slide. Concept C removes the reversible lane system. Uh, during both the peak and off-peak periods, we're looking at two lanes in each direction. It does provide a protected bike lane on both the east and west side, um, as well as opportunities for left turn pockets and parking in commercial areas. Uh, parking along the corridor would need to be removed as part of this option. Next slide. Uh, this is showing a rendering of what that Cross section would look like on the left, you're seeing two travel lanes in each direction with a protected bike lane on both sides of the street. This also does include a bus floating island or Zika platform, uh, which prevents conflicts between buses and bikers on the street. Next slide. Uh, this is just showing a cross uh, layout of different cross sections for concept C on the main line section for two lanes in each direction with a protected bike lane. Um, in the middle is where we're accommodating a left turn pocket. And then on the right is where parking would be provided on one side of the street for commercial uh, for commercial businesses. And this parking would be 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Next slide. Concept DO, one of the reversible lanes. Um, this would require upgrades to lane usage signage and signals. Uh, during the peak hour, there would be three travel uh, three lanes in the travel peak direction, travel direction, sorry, and two in the off-peak travel direction. Uh, during the off-peak periods, there would be two lanes in each direction with a parking and loading lane on the northbound side. This concept is different from the others uh, where we are providing a, a two-way cycle track that's protected on the western side of the street. Um, due to DDOT's bicycle facility design guide, we do require that vehicles have a protected left turn pocket in order to prevent any conflicts between the cycle track users and vehicleists. Um, in this case, because we are retaining the reversible lane, that would not be constructible. Concept D1 similarly does have the two way protected cycle track on the west side of the street. However, this concept removes the reversible lane system. Uh, for this, there would be two lanes in each direction at all the day. Um, as part of this as well, there would be a northbound loading and parking lane or opportunities for left pockets as part of this concept. 
Next slide. Concept D2 is very similar to D1, uh, having the two-way protected cycle track, removing the reversible lane. But in terms of traffic operations here, there would be two northbound and two southbound travel lanes with a two-way center left turn lane during the peak period. And then during the off-peak operations, one northbound travel lane and two southbound travel lanes with the two-way center left turn lane in the middle. Um, there would also be opportunities to retain some northbound and loading as part of this option as well. Concept E combines all the elements that we just talked about before. This removes the reversible lane system. During both the peak and off-peak periods, there would be two travel lanes in each direction with parking on both sides of the street. Um, this would also include the two-way cycle track that's protected on the western side of the street as well. However, the fatal flaw of this concept is that it does require DDOT to move out of the 60-foot right-of-way, which doesn't conform with the guiding principles of the project and would conflict with the Cleveland Park streetscape design uh, further along the course. So as part of uh, the study, we also developed some evaluation criteria to evaluate the different concepts. Uh, criteria included traffic safety and operations, bicycle, pedestrian, transit accessibility, comfort and operation uh, criteria, parking, loading, pickup drop off, and constructability and implementation criteria. These are all consistent with a number of plans that we are uh, using as guiding, guiding documents with the District of Columbia, so move DC, Vision Zero, the bike master plan, et cetera. We did develop a concept scoring matrix to compare alternatives. We were fairly objective in trying to score each of these. Um, the evaluation wasn't weighted as the corridor has varying needs and scoring is relative to each of the concepts. So the first screen that we did was a fatal flaw analysis. So really anything that was outside of the 60 foot right of way and the only concept that uh, failed to do that was concept E or did that was concept E. Uh, the second criteria that we looked at, the second screening was looking at evaluation criteria. So the ones that we just talked about, traffic safety and operations, et cetera. Um, the only concepts that received negative scores were due to the lack of um, things such as safety improvements, multimodal improvements, parking and removal, et cetera. Um, as you can see on the final row was his scoring. The only two concepts that received positive scores were concept B and C, and therefore those are the only concepts that will be moving to the second tier and level evaluation um, on the next couple of slides that Michael will be talking about next. Thank you, Cynthia. Anne-Marie is going to talk a little bit about safety and mobility. Hello. Um, so concepts B and C provide the opportunity to make safety improvements along the corridor. Uh, firstly, removing the reversible lanes will eliminate crashes caused by the confusion on how to use them, uh, specifically those tur left turns from the wrong lane. Um, removing parking at crosswalks and near intersections uh, will improve visibility for all users. Protected bike lanes are associated with uh, decreases in vehicular crashes, as well as protecting cyclists mid-block. Pedestrian refuge islands are also associated with a reduction of crashes, both pedestrian and vehicular. Turn lanes uh, are also associated with reduction of crashes, um, and also they will protect cyclists in a, in a cycle track uh, from left-turning vehicles. And lastly, we had the opportunity to install left turn calming treatments, which is an innovative treatment that slows left turning vehicles, reducing conflicts with pedestrians and other people in the crosswalk. The next slide, please. So concept B uh, provides the opportunity to install left turn calming treatments at, at selected intersections. We can also clear the corners for improved visibility throughout the corridor. Uh, in addition, we can uh, look to study uh, a few things for feasibility, and that includes hawk signals at Chesapeake and Legation Streets, no right turn on red, and, and looking at several intersections for uh, our approach realignment to kind of shorten pedestrian crossings. Next slide, please. Uh, concept C provides the 
as well as the things that we had talked about before, also provides the opportunity to uh, install left turn pockets and pedestrian refuge islands. Thank you. Next slide. Uh, as we move forward with more detailed design and safety improvements, DDOT can study where bus stops on the corridor may be relocated to the far side or consolidated. A preliminary analysis shows up to 17 bus stops may be moved, may be examined for feasibility of moving to the far side. Thank you. Thank you, Anne Marie. Uh, Michael <coughs> is going to talk a little bit about parking and loading now. Michael? Um, thanks, Ed. Uh, so, the next few slides will uh, review the park and loading evaluation we performed for concerts B and C. Uh, what we have here is really a snapshot of the of the impacts for for each of these concepts. Concept B removes 21 spaces, uh, and as Anne Marie indicated, uh, that's really just to achieve visibility at crosswalks. Um, and then uh, for concept C, in order to uh, maintain uh, the 60 foot curb to curb width and install a bike lane, uh, parking loaded would have to would have to be removed from one side. Uh, and this may alternate between the northbound and southbound sides to maximize the use of spaces. Um, the results of the concept C scenario that were uh, based on a detailed look on the, uh, at the corridor, we, we went through each of those slides in the learning room. Uh, approximately, uh, well, 288 spaces were retained and 321 spaces were removed. Uh, in terms of loading, 18 spaces were retained and six spaces uh, were removed. Next slide, please. Understanding that concept C has a greater impact on parking and loading as compared to concept B, we looked at possible solutions to increase the parking and loading for concept C. Uh, one is that we can uh, have these have those spaces that, that are retained uh, available all day long. Uh, this provides a net gain in terms of the total weekly availability along the corridor as compared to what the current restrictions allow. Uh, we, we're looking at converting uh, parking spaces potentially to pick up drop off or loading. Uh, that seems to be a, a, a lack of uh, Pluto and uh, loading spaces along the corridor. So we would look at converting some uh, existing spaces perhaps uh, into, into uh, other types of spaces. Uh, we would also review the current uh, alley access and see how they're being used for loading and if there are opportunities to expand on that uh, with. Uh, with with any concept, uh, honestly, to improve the loading along the corridor. Next slide. So, as as I mentioned, we did a real detailed dive into the corridor. Uh, we broke it up into ten segments uh, to uh, to to really look at how what what concept B and C would look like uh, based on our preliminary uh, determination of of the uh, of the uh, corridor in terms of uh, the, the retaining of parking. Uh, each map provides an existing inventory of parking. So you see the big numbers there, they either represent uh, the number of spaces or the amount of feet of loading. Um, concept B primarily just removes uh, spaces for uh, visibility where concept C uh, in order to uh, add the uh, protected bike lane, uh, would would have uh, removal of parking on one side or the other. Uh, on this slide, what we're showing is uh, is uh, things like, well, in addition to the loss of parking, we're also showing uh, turn lanes, and that would impact transition areas on the corridor, as well as some potential conversion to park to loading of ex ex existing spaces. Uh, there's also some additional information provided on these maps to provide context for the uh, for the corridor. Next slide. This is uh, really uh, a, a summation of what I of all the maps that that uh, we presented in the uh, in the earlier learning room. Uh, you can see the total number of spaces, just over 600 available currently on the corridor, with about 577 feet of loading, which. Uh, under concept B, we'd be removing 21 spaces. Under concept C, we'd be removing 321 spaces, retaining 288 spaces, and we'd also be retaining the majority of loading uh, along the existing corridor. Next slide. 
Thank you, Michael. I'm going to talk a little bit about travel demand forecasting to give you a little bit of a primer as to you know how we forecasted our traffic and and uh, and then some of the limitations of the model. Uh, so the first thing we did was uh, we took existing traffic counts and they were pre-COVID traffic counts. Uh, we then used a model and we calibrated the model to existing conditions, and that means we tried to match, uh, and we did match. We our model matched uh, the existing counts uh, uh, that we took during pre-COVID. We then used uh, our 2045 uh, Metropolitan Washington Council of Government, their land use and population and employment data, uh, and that allowed us to prepare no build traffic models. We then considered our alternatives and looked at the number of lanes uh, in, in the no build concept, the number of lanes in concept B, and the number of lanes in concept C. And as we said, concept B reduces the number of lanes by one peak hour, peak direction lane, and concept C reduces the number of lanes on Connecticut Avenue by two peak hour, peak direction lanes. Then we put that information in our model again, and we prepared 2045 build forecasts. And once we had our forecasts, that allowed us to look at uh, traffic diversion, it allowed us to look at capacity and delay and level of service at intersections. And it allows us to look at travel time, uh, the travel time differences between uh, concepts. So some of the limitations and the assumptions in the traffic model, as I said, we focused on concepts B and C and the no build, since the model is sensitive uh, to the number of changes in the, in the changes in the number of lanes. Models are, are good, relatively good at forecasting traffic on higher volume roads than they are on lower volume roads. The model does not consider potential mode shifts that might occur in the study area, such as additional transit or metro ridership, which we know may happen. The bot model does not consider potential changes such as more people working from home as a result of the dynamics created by the pandemic. And the study considers a year 2045 planning horizon and does not consider changes in traffic volumes on a year to year basis. Uh, Michael's going to talk a little bit about traffic diversion uh, and level of service. Michael. Thanks, Ed. Uh, so the, the daily <clears throat> diversions were modeled uh, for concept B and C based on the the 2045 no build traffic volumes. A portion of the uh, diversions will occur within the secondary secondary study area corridors where the, <clears throat> the rest will go to more regional roadways. Uh, the daily diversions for concept B and C were distributed over uh, a five hour peak morning period and a five hour peak afternoon period. So in other words, uh, the 24 hour diversion volumes were spread over 10 hours uh, since that's the change in operations uh, all, with removal of the reversible lanes, and then the remaining 14 hour of the days would uh, would remain consistent with uh, current operations and would not include diversions. Next slide. Uh, so what we determine is that 55 to 60 percent of traffic diversions will occur within the secondary study area, while 40 to 45 percent will travel on regional roadways such as uh, Georgia Avenue, Claire Barton Parkway, Canal Road, I-495, MacArthur Boulevard, and, and Georgia Avenue. Um, uh, so when you look at concept B, uh, the uh, approximately 3,200 vehicles were diverted under uh, to the um, of the 3,200 vehicles diverted, about 2,000 were diverted to the uh, secondary roadways and about 1,200 to regional roadways. Uh, concept C has uh, uh, just over twice as um, the number of, of, of traffic volume diversions, whereas uh, 3,900 would routing to a secondary study area, and uh, the remaining 3,100 would route to uh, regional roadways. And if you just take a look at the at the flow chart to the right, it shows how the daily diversions are converted into hourly diversions during the the, the highest peak hour. Uh, to the and, and this represents the the key north south roadways. So you see how that's distributed. Next slide, please. 
This slide <clears throat> represents the diversions graphically using green lines to show decreases in peak hour volumes and blue lines to show increases in peak hour volumes. Uh, I should note that the line weight does not represent the total volume uh, of the diversion. It represents the relative increase or decrease as compared to the 2045 volumes. In other words, just because it's a wider line does not mean there's more diversion than an narrower line. It just means that the percentage of the uh, existing traffic is is um, is closer to the the relationship between that and the and the peak hour diversion is higher. <clears throat> um, and again, uh, so you can see that the uh, under the graphic on the right illustrates how the diversions would occur on the adjacent north south roadways. And again, concept C diverts approximately twice as much as concept B. Next slide. Uh, so, so following our diversion analysis, we took a look at uh, at how the uh, the multimodal users are balanced uh, through the corridor through each condition. Uh, and the, <clears throat> the chart to the left, no build condition. Uh, approximately 61% of the vehicles on the corridor are cars, and the remaining are uh, metro rail, bicycle, and bus users. Uh, very uh, small number of bicycle users currently uh, under concept B. Uh, really, the, the that the percentage of cars drops uh, due to the diversion away from the corridor, it, it, and it just slightly increases the other uses as a percentage of the total. Uh, when you look at concept C, you see that that the um, that would create a, ba a more balanced uh, multimodal corridor, where you have where you uh, go from 61% on note build to 51% under concept C. Uh, we, uh, you can see that we've included uh, bicycle forecasts. We've actually also included a 2% modal shift. Although our traffic model does not include that, we're aware that uh, some of this, a small amount of, um, of diversion would be actually occur to uh, uh, public facilities like Metro Rail and buses. Next slide, please. We're now to move into uh, our analysis uh, at an intersection level for intersection level service and delay. And for those of you that are not aware of level of service, it is uh, essentially a grading system from A to F based on vehicle delay through an intersection. Uh, LOS are reported for the highest hour in the morning and the highest hour in the afternoon. An intersection operating with less than 55 seconds of delay is, is generally denoted as level of service D or better. And, uh, an intersection operating between 55 and uh, 80 seconds of delay is E, level service E. Uh, an intersection with greater than 80 seconds of delay would be level service F. Uh, e and F uh, represent uh, generally constrained conditions at an intersection. Next slide. So, uh, just in terms of the results of the analysis, we're going to Kind of look at a high high level uh, overview of, of the results, and if you look at the table uh, on the, the top of the slide, uh, this represents the AM peak hour, and and you see that for uh, the 44 intersections that we studied, that included the primary and secondary study areas, approximately three to four of those intersections would operate a level service F. Uh, the intersections to note are Nebraska and Connecticut Avenue, Nebraska Avenue and Broad Branch Road. Beach Drive and Tilden Street and Nebraska Avenue and uh, Ward Circle North. We'll now, uh, next slide please. We'll now look at the PM peak hour results. Uh, this uh, under the PM peak hour, uh, four to five intersections of the total 40, of 44 study area intersections operate at level service F. The intersections to note on the primary study area include Nebraska Avenue and Connecticut Avenue. Cathedral Avenue and Connecticut Avenue. And then the secondary study area, Western Avenue and River Road, Reno Road and Military Road in Nebraska and Ward Circle North. Thank you, Michael. I'll go over uh, quickly some of our traffic analysis uh, conclusions. Uh, one, uh, level of service capacity and delay for concepts B and C do include diversions to the secondary study area and to regional roadways. Concept C diverts more traffic than concept B. Uh, in terms of our study area intersections with level of service F during the highest AM and PM peak hours, 
Uh, we have three to five intersections of the 44 intersections that we looked at uh, that do have capacity delay uh, and level of service. Uh, uh, I would say uh, issues that, that are beyond level of service uh, uh, E. Or e. Delays would result uh, from the overall intersection as well as individual intersection approaches. And our model diversions must occur for traffic operations to operate at acceptable levels of service for some intersections along Connecticut Avenue. In terms of estimated travel time during the morning uh, going southbound on Connecticut Avenue, concept B uh, would increase uh, travel time by three minutes and concept C would increase travel time by seven minutes. In terms of uh, uh, the evening peak hour going northbound, concept C would add four minutes of travel time and concept C would add eight minutes of travel time. We looked at uh, a couple of what if uh, scenarios. Uh, so what if the magnitude of our diversions are less than we modeled? Intersection delay would increase, level of service conditions, uh, uh, level of service F conditions may not be mitigated by signal timing adjustments alone. Harder travel times would be longer. Modal shifts and behavioral changes such as more teleworking would need to occur. And what if our concept B and C in the year 2045 uh, traffic volumes were 10 to 20% lower than we modeled uh, due to changes in behavioral uh, behavior such as increased teleworking? Our level of service would improve, our harder travel times would improve, and less diversion would occur. I think that ends our formal presentation, and I'm going to turn the meeting over to uh, Charlotte and Ian uh, to moderate uh, questions and answers. Thank you, Ed. Um, just to let everyone know, if we do not get to your question, we will be publishing all questions and answers on the project website. Um, so, just make sure that you check the project website and we will get those posted as well. So, Ian, we'll start with our 1st question. Thank you, Charlotte. Thanks. Ed. The 1st question, since 2014, move DC has designated Connecticut Avenue as a bike priority corridor. How can we do anything other than option C? Um, the move DC is our long range plan. But we also have to give equal weight to our feasibility studies that we're conducting now. Uh, our um, uh, studies of traffic and parking and environmental concerns. And so the feasibility study, uh, uh, in, a, in addition to what the long range vision is, uh, will help form our, our final recommendation. Thank you. Ed. Given DC priorities for reducing carbon emissions, sustain DC, increasing non-vehicle travel, move DC, and eliminating traffic deaths, vision zero DC, how can DDOT seriously consider implementing anything else? This is a, a further elaboration off of uh, question one in option C. Yeah, I think I answered that question yeah. in the, in, yeah, in, in, uh, initially, yeah. Yeah, can we accept the no build but eliminate the lane reversal and just let the roadway have two lanes northbound and southbound with parking on both east and west sides to move traffic efficiently and protect pedestrians all at the same time i think that? yeah I, I think uh concept b eliminates the reversible lanes and it keeps parking uh, it keeps uh uh basically uh, essentially it keeps parking on both sides during the um uh, off peak hours, uh, essentially, um, uh, concept B is, is doing what you're saying. Michael, do you have anything to add? No, yeah, that that's exactly right. Ed. the concept B would, would remove the reversible lane and, and keep a consistent cross section. Uh, the, it would maintain, uh, the, the, the capacity, uh, with less diversions. So we would maintain 3 lanes each direction during peak periods. And in off peak, it would be uh, exactly the way it is uh, today. Yeah, and, and I might guess that that the speed, and and you can correct me if I'm wrong, um, everyone, but I think the speed in concept B, the speed of traffic would be greater than in concept C, uh, because you do have six flowing lanes uh, of traffic, um, uh, you know, during those peak hours. So, um, any other thoughts on that one? 
If not, let's go on to the next question. I'm actually going to move it over to Charlotte. She has a, a question from uh, Facebook. Thank you, Ian. Does this study assume that Rock Creek Parkway slash Beach Drive is open for commuters like it was pre pandemic? If the parkway continues to be closed to traffic or is closed permanently, how might that affect the study's assumptions? Yeah, I think um, uh, our model specifically did not take this, this uh, potential eventuality uh, into account, but I can tell you that the studies that were conducted when uh, the Rock, Rock Creek was under, uh, Parkway was under construction was that uh, there was actually lower volumes on some of the parallel routes, believe it or not, uh, lower volumes on uh, um, 16th Street, on 14th Street, uh, on Connecticut. And, and I think what, what uh, the study um, found uh, was that uh, uh, people were diverting uh, from Connecticut Avenue even before they got to the corridor. So, you know, if they were north of the Beltway, uh, you know, they were actually going around the Beltway because the travel time was approximately, you know, equal or better than it was, you know, trying to, to go on some of the parallel routes. So I think um, uh, that's what the study found when when uh, uh, Rock Creek uh, was closed um, uh, a couple of years ago. Thanks, Ed. Next question. In your evaluation metrics, allowing for plus and minus ratings, for various items, please explain why bike slash scooter use is rated as higher priority than pedestrian safety, as well as transit, pick off, drop off, pick up, drop off, and constructability. Uh, I think, um, uh, as as Cynthia said, uh, they uh, ratings there. Uh, we have adject adjectival ratings as well as uh, numerical ratings. Um, they. Um, we truly believe we were objective in 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 evaluating the um, uh, you know uh, placing the numbers where they were and you know really what we wanted to see is you know where does the al entire alternative shake out is it in the negative territory or is it is it in the positive territory uh, so you know we can argue if if one number you know we may not agree with one number or the other but in terms of the aggregate you know. Um, do we believe that an alternative is in positive or negative territory? And that's what we're really looking at. Um, you know, we can we can talk about one number or the other, but but you know, is the number really um, is the alternative or the concept really going to to be in positive territory? Pat, and I'll just uh, follow up on on that. And as as you noted in uh, earlier in the presentation, that there isn't a concept that satisfies all uh, all elements of the purpose and need. So, in other words, if, if there was a concept that served everything, it would get all plus twos, but we can't, you know, that's just not possible given the current cross section. So, uh, I, you know, I, I think we, we, we did rate each of the items uh, with respect to providing or not providing an element of the purpose and need. Thanks, Ed. Thanks, Michael. Uh, if parking is alternated from east side to west side and back, would drivers and delivery persons be at great, greater risk in crossing the busy roadway surface? Michael, would you like to take that one? Sure. Uh, actually, the reason why we want to, what we're looking to alternate uh, uh, parking on either side and loading uh, is, is to try to take advantage of uh, a existing loading spaces, and then B uh, provide the best access that we think we can. Uh, there, we're also looking at uh, in areas where uh, parking is on one side and there's loading needs on the other. Uh, if if you if you can um, imagine the slides that we presented earlier, uh, there were uh, we we've shown opportunities where we think we might be able to convert spaces to loading. Uh, currently, there's there's a shortage of loading on the corridor, and and we're seeing a lot of double parking by by uh, uh, trucks double parked along the corridor. So we're looking to address an existing issue too. Uh, but yes, that, I, that's something that we are considering as part of our uh, evaluation, and as we move into the next phase of design, with that, whichever concept it is, uh, we'll be looking at opportunities to improve on the existing loading situation. Thanks, Ed. Thanks, Michael. Next question. Move DC calls for moving 75% of commuter trips out of private vehicles. 
yet your analysis for even concept C shows only 50% of trips on Connecticut Avenue moving to non car modes. Is DDOT being aggressive enough? Uh, I would say that the 75% goal is aspirational for the district as a whole. Um, so you can see the numbers that we have are, are the actual uh, bus ridership numbers for the corridor, the 4,300, I think that we showed, and the metro ridership uh, for, um, I think, 15,500. So, um, you know, we're looking at one corridor and, and, and those are our best estimates. And again, um, as I've told some folks, um, uh, WMATA, they really don't do long range estimates uh, of, 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 of metro or, or bus ridership. It's more of a, a short term estimate. So um, we um, uh, would be looking at, um, uh, I think, the number, the, the rough numbers that we have. Uh, but the, the, as, as you said, the district as a whole is looking at that 75% number. Thanks, Ed. I'm going to ask one more question, and then I'm going to turn it over to Charlotte for a call in. Uh, a call in. Are there anticipated changes in travel times in the corridor outside of the AM PM rush hours, which is to say, will travel times be different in the 90% of the week that is not rush hour? Michael, do you want to take that one? Uh, sure. So, uh, as, as we talked about in terms of diversions, the, uh, Really, the the impacts that we that we expect are would be more peak hour driven since that's when uh, the cross section would the operation of the cross section would change. Uh, so currently, uh, during during commuting hours, uh, the uh, you have you know it's four hours in the peak direction, two hours in the off peak direction, and then in the off peak period, it's two lanes in each direction. So in our evaluation of uh, both concepts. Uh, the two lanes in each direction are retained during off peak hours. So we expect minimal impacts during those periods since people won't have to change their, their travel habits uh, during those hours. I'm gonna now turn the next question over to Charlotte. Um, thank you, Ian. Um, call in user 202643. Um, we will unmute you so you can pose your question. Um, okay, uh, thank you. Thank, thank you for having this meeting. Uh, my name is Tim Hampton. I've been a, tra a victim of traffic violence, and so is my spouse and one of our kids. Uh, and we've all got in front of us an option right now, option C, that makes the street a lot safer for everyone. Uh, with 30 people dying every year from traffic in D.C., um, if, if they could be here at this meeting, I think we know what option they would pick. So please choose safety. Thank you. Thank you. Ian, I'll turn it back over to you for the next question. Thank you. Uh, I understand that there are two groups that are against overhead signs or arrows, but I think that arrows overhead would help enormously for reversible lanes. Is there any possibility of having overhead arrows like these, like these are that like there are on Colesville Road? Thank you. Yeah, I was actually just going to use that as an example, and uh, yes, they would help. Um, and that's something that uh, you know we've looked into, and I think even the 2003 uh, traffic study of Connecticut Avenue uh, recommended that we we look into. Uh, but again, uh, this is a a visual corridor. It's a corridor that uh, goes into um, uh, the downtown area. Uh, it's, we have historic um, elements within the corridor. And so, um, you know, the advice that we've been given by Commissioner Fine Arts and, and as I said, the State Historic Preservation Office uh, uh, is that they, um, you know, would recommend against that. And again, um, um, so, so that's what we've, um, you know, they're, they're also on our interagency task force and uh, that's an option that we've discussed, but, uh, um, you know, they've, they've told us they would not support it. Thanks, Ed. The next question: Do diversion data actually does diversion data take into account effect of double parking to load and unload, particularly under option C with two lanes of traffic, particularly diversion to local alter, alternate routes? Uh, Michael, do you want to get uh, that question? Sure. Uh, well, we're not. I mean, that's. Um, 
it would be prohibited to stop and load along the corridor in the in the uh, in the travel lane. Uh, I know vehicles do it now, uh, but a component of of uh, of any change in operations is enforcement. Uh, so no, we did not uh, we did not assume uh, that there would be cars parked in the travel lane or the, mo the model doesn't look at. Um, uh, one off conditions like accidents happening on the corridor. Uh, yes, when an act, when, a, when something occurs, it blocks the lane. It would uh, impact traffic just as it would today, uh, creating a, a choke point. But no, that's not something that we would evaluate as part of our analysis. Uh, I want to ask uh, e, e if he has anything to add. Um, no, I think Mike covers it. Okay, thank you. The next question, I'm gonna uh, give it to Charlotte. She has uh, someone with their hand raised on the phone. Go ahead, Charlotte. Thank you, Ian. Um, can we unmute Adam Schaefer so he can pose his question? Thank you. According to your pre-pandemic existing conditions report, which chose not to mention the obvious, obvious decline in wintertime bike usage, the average intersection on Connecticut Avenue sees under 100 cyclists per day. Meanwhile, there are 30,000 cars that utilize the same corridor every day. You admit that virtually all of these road users will be negatively impacted by concept C, either by diversion or by making the same trip down a more congested Connecticut Avenue and take over 50% longer. And by diverting thousands of cars daily to places like Wisconsin, Mass, Reno, et cetera, you're making travel more difficult for almost 100,000 other drivers per day. Given these statistics, which are your statistics, how can you in good conscience justify punishing about 125,000 cars per day to appease 100,000 cyclists? Uh, I'm sorry, 100 cyclists. Um, thank you for your comment, uh, Mr. Schaefer. Um, I would say that um, we are looking at the, the vision uh, and the mission uh, uh, of DDOT and also the, the vision of the District of Columbia when we are looking at taking into account all of the plans or as we said, uh, move DC and our sustainability and our resilience uh, plans um, for the future. So we're looking at the vision and the future of, of what Connecticut Avenue needs to look at. Um, yes, uh, we have a low uh, bicycle usage today, uh, but the projections for bicycle usage would be just over 3000 uh, bikers per day uh, if we, um, uh, accommodate um, uh, an alternative that has a protected bicycle facility. Uh, so I think uh, we're looking at safety and we're looking at uh, multimodal accessibility and, and mobility uh, as, as part of the vision of the corridor. Um, there's no decisions that have been made yet and, and we're seeking input from everyone as to, uh, um, you know, what, what you believe that, that you would, that how, what you think the corridor should look like, uh, you know, in 25 years from now. Thank you. Next question in concept C, are you now proposing to include some parking slash loading on every block? This severely impacts the comfort capacity and potentially safety of the protected bike lane. Initially parking for concept C was discussed only on commercial blocks. I think what we said is that uh, we would be looking at parking in the 4 commercial nodes. Um, uh, along the corridor, uh, we would consider uh, potential other areas. Uh, if there are uh, condos or apartments or other residential areas that, that may have. Some deficiencies where they don't have surface parking, or they may not have circular driveways, uh, but we are going to look at this on a block by block basis. Uh, we'll work with the property managers. We'll work with uh, uh, the commercial and the, the businesses, and um, you know, look at everything on a block by block basis uh, in any next phases of design. And that's only if a concept C is selected. Thanks, Ed. I'm going to turn it over to Charlotte. She has a Facebook question. Thank you, Ian. Um, the Facebook question is, what is CFA's specific objection to overhead signage and why does CFA get a veto? Um, we, uh, this is a, a federal project number one and 
and we will be doing environmental documentation. And part of that environmental documentation is is our Section 106 process. And and so we have there are laws uh, that we have to follow. And one of the main objectives is is the visual. Uh, you know the the, um, the overhead signals would potentially be a visual visual blight uh, to the corridor since uh, you know uh, we have. Um, um, this is the District of Columbia, and and this is a historic corridor. So I think um, uh, we will be going through the environmental documentation process uh, if um, if we select either concept B or C, and 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 um, I, I think historic issues and and uh, visual issues are are going to be important considerations. Thank you, Ed. Next question: Many of the, many of the businesses along Connecticut Avenue are small independently owned businesses who rely on on street parking to attract customers. What would you say to them if you eliminate on street parking? Are they simply out of luck? Any plan to augment, augment parking? As I said, we're going to look at um, if a concept that has a bicycle facility is ultimately selected, you know, we'll look at each block face uh, on a on a um, uh, every block. Uh, we will look at uh, potentially increasing or, or taking the two hour spaces, perhaps if there's a two hour space on a block and making that uh, pick up drop off or, or short term spaces. So if you make a third, if you make a space 30 minutes um, and one is a space is two hours today, then you can turn that space over potentially uh, up to four times. And so we'll be working with the businesses uh, to do the best job that we can to um, save as many parking spaces as we can uh, within the commercial nodes. Thank you, Ed. The next question. In response to the caller, why do your numbers not include the significant pedestrian usage along the corridor? Uh, our numbers uh, we have uh, in our existing conditions report, and you can look at that report uh, on our website. Uh, we have pedestrian counts at all of our, our intersections that we looked at, uh, all 44 intersections. Okay. The next question. A four minute delay for many people is much less of a punishment than the risk of death or dismemberment of a sizable minority of unit, uh, users. And that's more of a statement is, so I'm sorry about that as a comment. The uh, question is, um, the level of service analysis that was discussed only addressed auto traffic. Did DDOT conduct a similar analysis of bike safety? I'm sorry, uh, bike, oh, my question moved. Sorry, they're coming in faster than I can read them and adjusting my question. <laughs> Sorry about that. What is the thing about the relative value of parking versus unused safety, safe transit? Basically, does provided short term parking in areas where there seems to be limited demand outweigh the value of making the street more multimodal and safer? That's a comment, right? Not a question. Well, the the part, last part was a question. It says there needs to be limited demand outweigh the value of making the street more multimodal and safer. So they want to know the short term parking in those areas uh, limited the demand outweigh the value of making the street more multimodal and safer. Uh, I think everyone has different values, uh, whether it's parking or bike lanes, and and I'm sure everyone you know wants pedestrian safety. Uh, and mobility and and people want you know traffic to flow as well. Um, people don't want traffic to stop and 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 just stack everywhere. Uh, so it's a value that everyone in the corridor, the residents, uh, and and the businesses and the shoppers put on on each of those um, uh, different modes uh, and uses. And, and so uh, as an agency, DDOT is trying to coalesce uh, all of these comments and. And make the best um, uh, decision and recommendation that we can um, based on all the different uses in the corridor. Some people uh, want all, not a one parking space to disappear. Others uh, believe that uh, parking uh, is, uh, you know, um, 
it, it's part of a, a valuable asset, a real estate, real estate asset within the corridor. So um, um, again, I'm not trying to make, and I don't think our team is trying to make a value judgment on uh, whether you know parking is good or 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 bike lanes are good. Uh, we're just trying to um, look at the vision of the district of Columbia and the mission of the agency and try to coalesce your your concerns with with that vision. Thanks. Ian. The level of service analysis that was discussed only address auto traffic. The DDOT conduct a similar analysis of bike traffic. If alternative C is not chosen, then where does DDOT expect people on bikes to proceed through the corridor safely? Sure, I, I'm gonna answer one part of that question and then I'll ask our active transportation team to maybe take the second part of the question. Uh, level of service specifically um, uh, that we're looking at is a, is a traffic measure of effectiveness. Delay uh, and, and capacity and level of service and queuing, uh, that's all part of a standard traffic engineering uh, analysis. Uh, for other, for bicycle analysis, we look at the operations. Uh, we look at um, uh, how it affects, how bikes may affect traffic, but I'm gonna let uh, our active transportation team take that second part of the question. Uh, is that Mike or Will available? Yeah, this is George. Um, or George? Uh, yeah, what, uh, restate the second part of the question. I, the, no problem. Or if, alter <laughs> if alternative C is not chosen, then where does DDOT expect people on bikes to proceed through the corridor safely? Well, I think it's pretty easy to answer that. If 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 a if a bike facility is not in the next iteration of the of uh oh, sorry, we can hear you now. So. Sorry. All right, sorry about that. Uh, if we don't have a bike facility on Connecticut Avenue, then they, it would be just as it is today. In other words, people would have to find alternate routes through the neighborhood bike routes that have been established and some other, uh, or, or or brave the conditions uh, on Connecticut Avenue uh, as uh, in, in much the same way as it is today. That would be the simple answer. Thank you, George. I'm gonna uh, turn this over to Charlotte. She has a question. Thank you, Ian. Um, what traffic calming and safety options would there be for pedestrians and bicyclists affected by the traffic diverted in option C? Please don't just move the problem over to their streets. Take the opportunity to address comprehensively. So, Ed, did you want to talk about some of the other traffic calming and safety options that was highlighted? Yeah, I, I think um, Anne Marie talked a bit on with the left turn calming uh, with some of the uh, 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 prohibitions for turning uh, at certain intersections. Uh, she's talked about some of the pedestrian refuge islands that, that we might be able to be doing. Um, so, Anne Marie, are you available to, to uh, further talk about that question? Yeah, um, although I interpret the question as, as meaning, uh, you know, uh, is there improvements beyond the corridor? Uh, because of traffic diversions for pedestrians and uh, in the area. Um, nevertheless, like on the corridor, we can certainly look at uh, pedestrian improvements, things like refuge islands uh, and the left turn calming treatments at, at heavily uh, used pedestrian crossings. Um, and I mean, looking at some of the more complex intersections that have um, uh, the, the angles aren't great uh, just, and, see if we can shorten the pedestrian crossings. So, thank you. I don't know if George might be able to address kind of the larger issue of the the area. Yeah, I was reading comments. I'm sorry. Can you re can you summarize that again for me? Um I interpreted her question as being that if traffic is diverted off of Connecticut Avenue into you know, the surrounding regions, what, what can be done for pedestrian safety? Yeah, no, it's a question. I think, you know, um, so, so not all roads operate uh, at full capacity, even during peak hours. So what happens is 
people who find the conditions on a changed Connecticut Avenue would perhaps, this is again, Ed studies trying to, and this is a, an art, not a science, of trying to figure out what decisions people will make um, faced with different traffic conditions. They will maybe try Reno Road or may, maybe go to Wisconsin. Um, and, and there's some excess capacity there. There's some excess capacity on Connecticut Avenue right now um, during rush hour, even pre-pandemic. It's not absolutely completely packed with level of service F all the time. Um, so, so people will make some decisions. Um, uh, some people may, if, if conditions for, for buses uh, or biking uh, or, or getting to the metro because of biking makes it easier. Those are some things that factor in to, to maybe get people to change the mode. So there are just a lot of different dynamics that can happen um, that, that people go through the calculus people make. So, um, you know, it's, it's um, it, it, there's no you know, absolute answer to that type of question, I guess is what I'm saying. Thanks, Anne Marie. Thanks, Ed and, and George. I'm going to ask uh, another question, then I'm going to turn it over to Charlotte for someone who has their hands raised. How much does reducing two hour parking reduce the amount of businesses local shops get? There are so few spaces currently, and turnover is so infrequent. It seems unlikely that parking availability is a significant factor in whether people go to a business. I think we uh, I can start off with that question, and I, I think um, we, we have shown studies and we do see studies that show that uh, if there is a a protected bicycle facility that sometimes the uh, or many times uh, the businesses will actually see an increase in, in, in revenue. Um, so I think um, uh, we were asked that question on Monday and I'm going to. Uh, locate those studies and put those studies up on, on our project website. Thank you, Ed. I'm gonna turn it over to Charlotte. Thanks, Ann. Um, can we unmute um, Ken Stump so that he can pose his question? Yes, hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you, Ken. Thank you so much for taking my question and for doing this, it's very helpful. Um, I uh, live in Cleveland Park. I've been here for a decade and I bicycled through the corridor a thousand times. I've also driven through it. And I, I would be a strong pro proponent of, you know, proceeding with uh, uh, the concept C. And I think, you know, there's many reasons it's consistent with mission and uh, vision of the city. Um, but um, my question is, you have selected uh, this as your principal study area, this 2.7 mile corridor, but the secondary study area, you indicated in the previous study room uh, presentation, uh, does in fact in extend from Western Avenue in the North to DuPont in the South. So if, I, I don't know what the process is going to be for deciding uh, whether you would extend uh, the uh, study area and choose the secondary study area as your primary focus going forward. I would certainly uh, want to see that happen. Um, and if, if it did though, I frequently go down Connecticut and <clears throat> through the Calvert Connecticut intersection right across the Taft Bridge because it's the fastest way into town. But if you're, if you are planning to pursue the secondary study area, do you envision uh, doing that with a bicycle route, or would you, uh, at Calvert, would you move bicycle route across uh, the Duke Ellington Bridge and then down toward Dupont that way, or do, or have you thought about that? Um. I'll start and then maybe George can can complete this. Um, our study is limited. Um, the, the, a, a, the alternatives that we're looking at um, are limited uh, to the Connecticut Avenue corridor. Essentially, you know, our scope uh, uh, looks at uh, just, uh, you know, should we uh, remove the reversible lane? Should we potentially uh, put in a protected bicycle facility? The second, what the secondary study area is, it's, it's in terms of uh, traffic really. Uh, and that is, uh, we're looking at the traffic impact of any alternatives as a result of 
uh, the, 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 the what, what concept we select uh, in, in, you know, uh, for Connecticut Avenue. And I think um, George might be able to answer the next question as far as what our bicycle master plan might have and other plans for other uh, protected bicycle facilities, you know, within Ward 3. Uh, George? Yeah, yeah, the, uh, yeah, so ending, um, you know, at, uh, at um, court does uh, connect you. I mean, actually, the first thing to say is that it's difficult to get over the Taft Bridge and then uh, connect up to what will be protected bike lanes um, that will start at about uh, Florida Avenue on Connecticut Avenue. That's another project that's in the works in design. Um, but the roadway changes its dimensions as it goes up from uh, Columbia Road uh, to the Taft Bridge. So that's that's a tough nut to crack. There's just uh, not a lot of room to work with there. Um, but it would connect you to the uh, Rock Creek Trail at, at um, Calvert. Um, uh, and then we are Mass Avenue. Um, we are working on uh, the first part of a sidewalk widening to create a, a wide side path on that. Um, first to uh, the AU area uh, ward circle and then further down in successive stages um, to get also down to, to about the Rock Creek um, area. Um, yeah, so, uh, you know, we do, we have uh, other projects that sort of get close to the same area, but you would have certainly more options for commuting into downtown uh, if there were a bike facility that would get down to Calvert. Thanks, George. So um, sorry. we have, yeah, I'm sorry, Ian. We have um, time for one more question. Um, and let me just pull in this Facebook question. Um, how does flipping back, flipping parking back and forth, east side, west side, as proposed in one of the options, allow for a continued contiguous bike lane. Uh, Michael, would you like to take that question? Sure. <clears throat> so, uh, wherever we have parking, we are, uh, having, we're, we're shifting. Essentially, we, we start with our typical cross section that, uh, that, uh, Cynthia presented. And then in order, in order to add a, a parking lane, uh, we have to narrow the bike lane, uh, and then narrow the buffer, uh, in order to do that. And. So shifting from one side of the road to the other, uh, the, the, the most significant impact of doing that is maintaining transi transition areas that work with design standards. So in other words, we, 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 you know, we can't go back, we, we can't go back and forth, uh, you know, multiple times mid block, uh, just because we wouldn't have the, the area, the, the sufficient space to shift traffic. Um, but on a, you know, on a, Kind of as we looked at multiple segments, I think over uh, as it as it works to shift for multiple blocks, uh, it, it it appears we can do that without uh, really uh, a whole lot of loss space resulting from it. But it all starts with uh, reducing the buffers uh, along the uh, along the bike lanes and, and slightly narrowing the lanes themselves. Thank you. Ed, and Ed uh, that was the last question that Charlotte uh, mentioned. We'll turn this back over to you. Uh, thank you, Charlotte and Ian. We're gonna go into our closing now. Uh, just to let you know, we did a, a very preliminary cost estimate. Um, and as we said earlier, the project is not currently funded for design or construction. Um, our planning level cost estimates would be the concept B would be uh, right around $2 million, about 1.9, and concept C would be approximately 4.6 million. Uh, your comments. So we will collect your formal comments uh, over the next 30 days. Uh, please send your comments through the Title VI form for documentation. This form is one of the key avenues through which DDOC documents your formal comments. The Title VI form will be automatically provided to you when you exit the WebEx public meeting. Click continue at the close of the meeting when you see the pop-up, it will take you to the Title VI form. DDOT will also email you the Title VI form uh, for those of you that are on our distribution list. You can also access the Title VI form uh, looking at the link that we have in red. 
We will keep a record of the questions and answers noted during the public meeting and we will publish them to the project website. This is a, an example of the Title VI survey form. As you can see, the link is in red. And in the lower uh, right-hand corner, you can see a QR code. And uh, to get the form, you just have to take your phone and snap the picture of the QR code and you'll get the form. So what happens next? Well, I wanna thank everyone for your attendance uh, at this general public meeting and all of the learning rooms today and, and on Tuesday. Uh, your comments are truly appreciated. Uh, we're going to collect your comments and prepare a recommendation. And that'll be sometime between the 1st of May and, and the middle of June. We're hoping that uh, we can meet with uh, DDOT's leadership by the end of June or the 1st of July. And then if a build select uh, alternative is selected, uh, staff will proceed with developing a conceptual design and then followed by environmental documentation. And then we would hope to hold a second public meeting uh, sometime in the fall. We will be holding virtual office hours uh, for those that uh, didn't get a chance to uh, maybe speak today or, or those that um, you know, had telephone access only and, and were not able to ask a question. Um, we're going to hold these uh, virtual office hours um, uh, on Tuesdays and Thursdays uh, from 2 to 4 p.m. Uh, from April 6th through April 29th. And again, uh, you might want to jot this number down, 1-888. 484-8424. I'll leave that up for a moment. Uh, our contact information, we've uh, uh, provided this before, but here is a uh, contact information again. Please use the project email as well. Uh, the project website is shown. And again, um, Project Manager Ed Stoloff, Cynthia Lynn, Deputy Project Manager Donise Jackson, our Community Engagement Specialist for DDOT Ward 3, and Charlotte Ducksworth and Ian Swain, our Community Engagement Specialist from Community 18. I think uh, that is the end of our formal public meeting. And again, uh, I appreciate all the comments and questions uh, uh, that you've provided. Uh, please keep them coming, uh, and we'll be happy to answer questions uh, uh, as they come in. So again, uh, have a good night, have a safe evening, and I look forward to speaking with you um, uh, later this month. Thank you.